Okay. Buenos días a todos. <coughs> Buenos días y estamos por estamos Recording iniciando. In progress. Good morning, good morning to you all. We're about to start. We're broadcasting today's Recording forum. Stop. We're celebrating the 80th anniversary. We're celebrating 80 years of the it's the anniversary, the 80th anniversary of the Inter-American Conference on Social Security. We have a, a, a great panel. It's just the highlight. At this panel, we're going to have uh, representatives of global scale that will communicate the vision about multilateral agencies or, or organisms. Our panel is called Multilateral Action for Social Security, so we don't leave anyone behind, OK? anniversary forum of the Inter-American Conference uh, of Social Security. And now we have uh, a fantastic uh, first panel that uh, has as uh, the title of the panel is Multilateral Action for Social Security. Let nobody uh, lag behind. So, uh, if you wish to follow, uh, the panel will be mostly in English. So for people who, don't, who speak English, this, this is going to be uh, natural um, to follow us without simultaneous translation. Para quienes eh, quieran escuchar el resto del panel. Que For those of you who want to listen to the panel's information, that's going to be, I mean, the panel, uh, our keynote speakers are going to be speaking English. You can follow us in streaming and, and digital means, Facebook, Twitter means, and other digital means, as I've said, or channels like YouTube. Well, I hope you have a great day. I... Bueno, espero, espero poder presentarles el primer panel del foro of the Inter-American Conference on Social Security for the audience of, for those who speak Portuguese, uh, those of you who are part of our panel are going to be used to stream the conference data in Social Security. If you, if you need those services or simultaneous interpretation services, follow us on YouTube. Okay, we're about to introduce our first panel, as I've just mentioned. There's uh, the panel is for us to start multilateral actions. First of all, we have our moderator, who will be with us during this panel. It's a pleasure. We have the leaders of different, um, well, uh, international labor organizations, and we have different representatives. Sarah is present with us. And we have Mr. Olivier de Schutter, the... Okay, we have Olivier de Schutter, who? Uh, uh, okay. And then after the keynote presentation, we have uh, the rest of the participations, so as to start the panel discussion with the participation of uh, Ms. Romina Boarini. Uh, she's the head, head of the, the WISE Center, and WISE uh, stands for Well Being, Inclusion, Sustainability, and Equal Opportunity of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Thank you, Romina, and welcome. Uh, and then we also have as a panelist, uh, Dr. Mariano Rojas. He's a professor of uh, the Mexican uh, National uh, Technological um, Institute or te uh, Tecnológico Nacional de México, uh, TECNM. Uh, muchas gracias y bienvenido, uh, Dr. Uh, Rojas. So, uh, thank you, Professor Rojas. Ahora, I'll tell you that in Portuguese, 
in Portuguese, the name of the panel is, I mean, the panel is multilateral actions for social security, so nobody is left behind. And so, okay, okay so, Thank you very much. Good morning to all the participants. Good afternoon to those of you who are joining from uh, Europe and Africa, and a very good evening to participants who are with us from the Middle East and Asia. It is indeed my great honor to be moderating this first panel of this important conference commemorating the 80th anniversary of the Inter-American Conference on Social Security. Um, in this session, our distinguished keynote speaker and our esteemed panelists will be addressing, as you just heard, the issue of multilateralism for Social Security, challenging us to really think about how the multilateral system can support national efforts in building universal Social Security systems that are rights-based, that are human-centered and capable of enhancing well-being and equality. But first, before turning to our keynote speaker and the panel, on behalf of the International Labour Organization, I would like to extend our best wishes to the Inter-American Conference on Social Security on the occasion of its 80th anniversary. Now, 80 years uh, is what we would usually associate with old age and retirement. But the mission of the Inter-American Conference on Social Security, which is to promote policies that strengthen social security systems, is far from old and certainly not time for it to be retired. In fact, this is a mandate that is, I would say, incredibly current, up-to-date and urgent. Having uh, been born in the middle of the Second World War in 1942, the founders of uh, our, the Conference on International Social Security understood very well the critical role of social security in managing and overcoming the economic and social devastations of the war uh, in the midst of which uh, it was born. Today, the world is facing similar challenges, multiple interrelated crises of a devastating pandemic that we're still not out of, existential risks that are coming with climate change, an upsurge in poverty and inequality, and very high levels of debt for many countries of the world. Now, while the COVID-19 pandemic clearly exposed some glaring deficits in social protection systems in the Latin America and Caribbean region and the rest of the world, it also triggered an unparalleled social protection response in an effort to really protect people's health, protect their jobs and incomes and livelihoods, and stabilize aggregate demand and foster social cohesion. But to be effective, investment in social protection must go beyond one-off crisis response measures and really be part of a broader and longer-term set of policies that build universal social protection systems that are set up to prevent poverty, to reduce inequalities of different kinds, and to contribute to employment creation. Now, over its 100 years of existence, uh, ILO constituents have adopted 31 social security conventions and 24 recommendations. This adds up to about one sixth of the entire body of international labor standards. And these are meant to guide countries in their efforts to build universal social security systems. Among the standards, uh, the Social Security Minimum Standards Convention of 1952, number 102, which is also celebrating this year its 70th anniversary, is the only international treaty that has a systemic approach to social security, giving the state the overall responsibility to establish and maintain a social protection system that can protect the population against the full set of life cycle risks and contingencies that people encountered, including the need for medical care and for income security over the life cycle from, from childhood to old age. 
Now, this year, we're launching a ratification campaign, as was requested by the International Labour Conference in 2021, with the aim of reaching the objective of at least 70 ratifications of this convention, of Convention 102, by 2026. Uh, at the same time, also as spurred by the socio-economic disruptions that were unleashed more than 10 years ago in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, as you know, in 2012, ILO constituents also adopted the Social Protection Force recommendation, number 202. And that recommendation also this year is celebrating its 10th anniversary. Uh, and it urges states to pursue and implement policies that are really aimed at securing universal, comprehensive and adequate protection for their population, prioritizing in this context the building of national social protection floors as a very important element of their social protection system. So that it's not just uh, ad hoc and fragmented approaches, uh, but really uh, efforts that build up and add up to a solid social protection floor. However, to ensure that social protection floors remain floors rather than become ceilings, the recommendation also en uh, has, uh, envisages a two-dimensional strategy, which is really urging countries to guarantee you know, at least a basic level of income security and access to essential health care for everyone, this being the horizontal dimension, but also to incrementally secure higher levels of protection for as many people as possible and as soon as possible, and this being the vertical dimension uh, of the social security system. And I think this two-dimensional strategy is needed today more than ever before. As we learned during the COVID-19 crisis, policymakers can overcome obstacles that we thought were insurmountable. Who would have thought that over a short period of time, workers in the informal economy could be brought under the coverage of social protection systems? And yet, at record speed, many countries have done so even if temporarily, and that, of course, is a big if, but still showing that it is possible to take decisive action. And the social protection responses to COVID have really raised expectations that the gaps in universal social protection systems can be closed and must be closed in anticipation of the multiple crises that we're facing. However, and this is really my last point, the alarm bell that the pandemic rung which everyone said, well, it's a, it's a wake up call about the urgency of investing in universal social protection systems. Today, I'm afraid that alarm bell is being silenced by the fiscal constraints that many countries are facing. In this context, I think to mitigate the risk of fiscal austerity, which is around us, will really require renewed efforts to ident identify financing options. And we believe all countries, even low income countries, do have a set of financing options to invest in their social protection systems, including by increasing taxation, by having a larger social security contribution base, uh, and by having more accommodating macroeconomic frameworks that allow deficit financing. And greater prominence can also be given to wealth and inheritance taxes, not only to be able to invest in social protection systems, but also to really be able to arrest this rising tide of inequality, which has continued during the pandemic and beyond. And this is a theme that I believe our panelists will be addressing. And financing options need to be grounded in the principle of solidarity, which encompasses both vertical redistribution, that is between high and lower income households, through, for example, progressive personal income taxes and contribution rates that are higher for higher income earners, but also horizontal redistribution, for example, between healthy people and sick persons, between women and men, between younger and older persons, and between families with and without children. So really, it's a question of redistribution and solidarity that has to be at the base. And in a highly globalized world, what we know is that domestic resource mobilization needs to be strengthened and enabled by a global financial architecture that can arrest the tide of illicit financial flows and prevent the race to the bottom when it comes to corporate taxes and really find workable solutions for internationally agreed debt restructuring and also explore more direct ways of increasing global financing for social protection 
to bridge the financing gap in many countries, uh, especially low income countries. And this is a topic that our keynote address, I'm sure, will uh, amply um, uh, elaborate. So allow me to really end my brief remarks by underlining that in a highly interconnected world, we cannot have a global financial architecture that is disconnected from the needs of the real economy, which is to create decent jobs, have universal social protection, and have universal and inclusive life and work transitions and structural transformations, green transformations as well. Policy coherence at national and international levels is key, and multilateral cooperation, as this panel will hopefully demonstrate, is absolutely fundamental to accelerate the effort to recover from the multiple crises that we have and to meet the SDGs. And it is with this objective in mind that in September 2021, the UN Secretary General launched the Global Accelerator on Jobs and Social Protection for Just Transitions, which is a UN-wide initiative that is being coordinated by the ILO. Mm -hmm. And this accelerator aims to ensure the necessary policy support and financing to create the millions of jobs that are needed and to extend social protection to 4 billion people who are currently excluded. And this new initiative has really the ambition to bring together the multilateral system to create an enabling global environment that will take us beyond merely reacting to crises to proactively anticipate and equitably manage the drift and transitions that are pending. So on that note, uh, I would like to now invite our keynote speaker to deliver his address. Over to you, Olivier. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, Shara, for this extremely useful. Uh, muchísimas gracias. Gracias por presentarme a la mesa de debate como panelista. Agradezco a todos su presencia esta mañana. Espero que podamos continuar trabajando en la Conferencia Interamericana de Seguridad Social. Celebremos todos los 80 años. Creo que eh, ya tenemos un panorama general o el marco general con la lista de desafíos que estamos todos enfrentando. Me gustaría sustainable development goals and 1.3 um, related to the first um, sustainable development goal on the eradication of poverty reiterates this commitment to make social protection floors universal and we have in international human rights law a series of um, norms that um, um, impose on countries to provide the right to social security to their populations but there is a huge gap between these commitments and the reality that people face. We still are um, not quite um, able to guarantee these entitlements uh, to populations in, in many um, developing countries and for many parts of the, of the population that are most um, marginalized um, and ignored in public policies. Um, the multilateral context, the international environment in which governments operate can, of course, help and should help more. Um, together with um, the ILO, we have been working for a number of years on the idea of how the financing of social protection could be better supported in countries which do not have the fiscal space necessary to invest in social protection. Um, we discussed in particular the scenario of establishing a new international financing mechanism called the Global Fund for Social Protection. Uh, the idea was um, encouraged by uh, a resolution adopted in June 2021 at the International Labour Conference. Um, and the idea is very simply that we should provide much greater attention to social protection in the support going to. Uh, to developing countries, in particular low-income countries. It is difficult to provide a precise estimate of the support given uh, to these countries for social protection, but one estimate which um, seems the most realistic is that um, currently only 0.65% of official development assistance 
goes to social protection. That is what um, uh, the estimate is from the uh, data of the um, uh, of the OECD um, and uh, um, the the development committee of the of the OECD in particular, and um, that is of course highly problematic given the very important role of social protection in creating the conditions for an inclusive and sustainable economic recovery. The ILO has estimated that if all low-income countries were to provide social protection floors as defined by recommendation 202 uh, to all their population, the financing gap they would need to obtain is equivalent to 78 billion US dollars um, per year. And that is about 55% of the total ODA expenditures of OECD countries um, for the year 2019. The total expenditure was 152 billion. Um, in other terms, it is an important sum, representing about 15.9% of the GDP of low-income countries, so it's unaffordable for them. But it is something that is affordable for the international community, particularly since to finance social protection, we cannot count only on ODA, of course. There are other sources of financing that can be identified, including uh, the use of um, special drawing rights, um, the, um, um, the debt restructuration and debt forgiveness policies that could be combined with commitments to invest more in social protection or um, carbon pricing schemes that could serve um, to protect better um, the, the poorest groups of the population with uh, robust social protection schemes. Unfortunately, we are not doing this. And I have to say um, that to me, as an external observer, it is problematic that when we um, identify sources of funding, we very often go through funds established under the auspices of uh, the International Monetary Fund that actually are not up to the task and do not really provide countries with the robust, reliable funding they need to have to invest in social protection. Let me take two examples. First, when the G7 finance ministers and governors of the central banks met in uh, June 2021, they uh, pledged to mobilize in support of poverty reduction and in, in reaction to the COVID-19 uh, induced crisis, the equivalent of 650 billion US dollars in special drawing rights. Out of this total amount, about 21 billion US dollars would go to um, LICs, uh, low-income countries, um, and of course, unused SDRs could support them further. Now, the, the, the problem is that this money goes through a poverty reduction and growth trust um, um, facility managed by the IMF, but that poverty reduction and growth trust, which has a great name, only provides loans, not grants, to countries, and the conditionalities imposed are very classic, including um, to maintain um, um, fiscal uh, uh, sustainability and, and, um, um, and, and, and reduce public expenses to have basically the equivalent of the classic macroeconomic structural adjustment programs of the 1980s and 1990s. And this is actually the exact opposite of what we need. And to take another example, when in, in May 2022, the IMF launched a new facility, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust, uh, for a funding about, of about 45 billion US dollars, uh, that uh, Resilience and Sustainability Trust is meant to support countries uh, in addressing climate change, to support recovery from COVID-19, but it is not supporting the establishment of standing social protection floors uh, based on providing people with entitlements they may claim to be covered from uh, birth to, to death, from cradle to, to, to grave, from child allowances, maternity benefits to old age pension, including unemployment benefits, uh, sickness uh, benefits, disability benefits, and so on. And so I, I believe we should be extremely um, uh, cautious in um, um, 
in 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 how we use these this this kind of support because unfortunately i can only um, find that the support we are giving to countries for the economic recovery is not actually implementing or helping to implement target 1.3 of the sdgs um, or um, to to make the promises of recommendation 202 um, on social protection floors a, a reality and then there is something else which is that uh, we have a very significant effort made towards social protection as a result of the COVID-19 induced global economic crisis. And the ILO um, social protection monitor very carefully documents all these efforts. But it is very striking that um, there is, um, there are some groups of population that do not benefit as much as um, they should from those efforts covering um, the population. In particular, um, it is striking that uh, in many cases, informal workers have not been able to benefit to uh, a similar extent as others, as uh, workers in the formal economy from these efforts. And that, of course, is especially important in, in many developing countries. I don't need to recall to this um, expert audience that the total um, uh, percentage of the global workforce that is informal is 61%, 2 billion people are either informal or in precarious forms of employment, and they have benefited less than, than others. Migrants, undocumented workers uh, are very rarely benefiting, although I should applaud Colombia's uh, choice to extend the protection to migrant workers from Venezuela uh, through Ingreso Solidario. Um, in many cases, um, people are left out because the programs that are provided are relying on online applications and um, many people in poverty do not have access to these programs because they don't have access to internet or don't have the required digital literacy. Um, in countries such as Peru, Bolivia, Paraguay, only 3% of the poorest quintile, the poorest 20% of the population have regular access to internet. And so when you establish social protection programs, however um, well-intended they may be, uh, that require people to go through online application processes, obviously that will result in um, many people being excluded. And that was indeed one of the major causes for what we call non-take-up of rights in the field of social protection documented in our most recent report um, to the Human Rights Council. Now, um, these exclusions, um, these violations of the principle that no one should be left behind in the field of social protection could, in my view, be best addressed by asking ourselves, what does it mean to provide people with entitlements they may claim as human rights? And it's very important to, to, to understand that social protection should not be treated as a sort of charity government provides to people in need. Social protection is a right people should be entitled to, and if they are excluded, they should have access to recourse mechanisms grounded in domestic legislation in order to claim the benefits uh, for which they normally should qualify. And this is the best way to avoid discrimination, to avoid um, um, instances of corruption leading to people being excluded. It is the best way to reduce the risk of stigma, shame, um, people not daring to claim benefits because they fear they will be ill-treated by social services with whom they interact because the relationship with these social services is deeply imbalanced if it is not a relationship based on a reciprocal relationship between the, 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 the rights holder and the duty bearer. So when you said, um, Shara, that we should um, think of social protection as rights-based, and this is exactly what recommendation number 202 on social protection floor says, it goes beyond um, a symbolic assertion that people have a human right. It has very practical consequences in improving the relationship between service providers and individuals in need who are rights holders. 
um, this um, can go a long way towards reducing the, the, the risk of non-take up and the exclusion of certain groups of the population. But it also requires that governments um, accept that they have duties to protect people in times of crisis, especially even if um, fiscal space is, is limited. And here I would like to, um, um, to, to, to make one clarification or to dispel perhaps a common misunderstanding. Um, in many circles, um, including in human rights circles, people often believe that social protection is something that should be provided at the end of a development process when economic growth allows for social protection to be provided as a sort of luxury item, a sort of prize you get at the end of a process of wealth creation. Um, and so um, you should uh, provide social protection once your finances are in good shape and provided it doesn't create an unsustainable um, uh, public deficit. Now, this is not what I call a rights-based approach. A rights space should start by saying that people have rights, that governments therefore have a duty to provide protection, and that duty extends to a duty to mobilize resources both domestically and by calling upon international support to make protection a priority because it is not a cost, because it is not a burden on public finances except in a purely accounting mode. Porque es una forma donde se puede invertir en el futuro. Como todos sabemos, la OIT puede tener sindicatos que ven que la inversión en protección social puede tener una situación muy importante sobre el crecimiento sostenible, porque permite que se edifique el capital humano para no tener que poner a los niños a trabajar, porque en los adultos jóvenes. protection There is one element I would like to um, emphasize and that relates to this idea of social protection as a human right um, that should provide entitlements uh, that people should be allowed to claim and, and that issue is that of targeting. Um, we know that in times of fiscal constraint, as public deficits are ballooning in all world regions, not least in Latin America, that targeting looks like a good idea. It seems that by targeting people, by uh, using proxy means testing to identify people in poverty and support those people only, we are making the best use of scarce public resources um, by uh, uh, addressing that particular group of the population. However, there are a number of problems related to excessive targeting, and I would caution against um, um, uh, trying to Uh, adopt a too narrow approach to whom should be covered. Uh, first, it leads to more bureaucratic hurdles being imposed. The more you target, the more people have to find the right documentation to apply, to prove their level of income, um, to show they are eligible. And the rates of non-take up, the number of people not claiming the rights that should allow them to, um, uh, to, to, to overcome a crisis, um, increase as a result of excessive targeting. Secondly, targeting leads to intrusive inquiries into the situation of the household or the individual, infringing on privacy rights, and very often creating a, a relationship of distrust between social services and, um, uh, and beneficiaries of social protection or intended beneficiaries of social protection. Thirdly, excessive targeting leads to under-inclusion particularly in countries which have a weak administrative capacity, which have a large informal sector, where there is a relatively low registration rate of children, and where social registries, which are costly to maintain, are incomplete, 
or not regularly updated. In those cases, a large, where a large part of the population lives in poverty and where targeting is difficult to achieve, universal support may be advisable, especially if it removes the stigma in, in claiming support, and especially if it can be more popular politically with the middle class, programs that are universal, programs that reach all the population are generally better financed because they are very popular across large parts of the population. And you could have targeted universalism, in other terms, cover everyone, but with a more generous coverage of those um, that can prove that they are fall below a certain level of income. Um, but I think it's extremely important, particularly in terms of crisis, uh, not to target too, nar too narrowly, and um, instances of over-inclusion are much less to fear than um, widespread under-inclusion, as we've seen in the past with excessive targeting. So these are some um, remarks I wanted to make um, based on uh, the, the, the recent uh, uh, studies we made on the economic recovery post-COVID-19. Yes, this is a time of opportunity. Many countries have realized that they were not sufficiently prepared to face a major economic crisis uh, such as this one. They realized that um, uh, they were uh, trying to support people with leaking water cans in effect, and that many people were not able to actually be covered by existing social protection schemes. Um, but unfortunately, there is still a long way to go uh, before social protection floors are made universal. And I think it's an absolute priority for a sustainable and, and uh, inclusive um, recovery. Um, let me thank you again for involving me in this panel, and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olivier, for that very um, rich uh, keynote address that I think touched on the broad macroeconomic issues uh, to do with the way in which the multilateral system can be doing more in support of countries' efforts to build universal white space social protection systems. And some of the things that are not happening that should be happening at that level, um, including opportunities through some of the new uh, trust funds that are being set up. Uh, and at the same time, also uh, giving us a very rich array of issues about the way in which widespread systems can be built in order not to exclude uh, people who should have access and the right to social security. Some of the risks of uh, going for uh, targeting, which may seem like a good idea because uh, of the um, expectation that you can actually reach those who are the poorest of the poor and the risks that that kind of uh, approach can actually end up excluding many of the intended beneficiaries. Uh, I think you left us with many, lots of ideas and lots of questions, but let me turn to some of our panelists, hopefully to elaborate a bit more on some of these uh, ideas. Uh, and here I want to turn to uh, Mariano, if I may, with a question. Uh, we heard a lot from Olivier about uh, the right to social security and the challenges that countries have of turning that right into reality. Now, your research focuses in particular on people's subjective sense of well-being. Um, and, and you say that there is more to well-being than income security. Now, if you could just give us a little bit of an indication, what are some of the issues that your research is bringing to the fore in relation to uh, what you can find, what you have found from talking to young people to as well as to older persons, that as social protection experts and actors, we kind of need to be cognizant of? the way in which we can be designing systems that can really enhance well-being and use people's subjective sense of well-being to design those systems. I would say in a way that complements uh, what we have already been hearing about white space systems. So over to you, Mariano. Well, thank you, Sara. Thank you for to the organizers for this invitation and for, for allowing me to share some of these insights from subject to well-being research, uh, I think it's important um, to keep in mind that in the end, uh, what we want with social protection, what we want with multilateral help, what we want with social policies and even with policy in general is to raise people's well-being. Uh, there is a final objective, which is for people to, to enjoy a better life 
uh, we can discuss what the better life means. But subjective well-being says, uh, let's ask people whether they are satisfied with life or not. And um, based on this question and uh, asking people, uh, we do research on the main drivers, what makes people satisfied with life or not. No? Uh, uh, and then we find some insight that I think is useful for policymakers in general, multilateral organizations. Uh, and this argument that, that you mentioned, that there is more to life than income, and that there are more important things in life for some people, I think it's important to keep this in mind. To, to have a, a people-centered perspective in social policy, uh, a more holistic perspective uh, when we talk about uh, improving people's lives. We are talking about human beings of flesh and, and blood, uh, concrete human beings living in the highlands, in the coasts. We, we are not talking about abstract consumers uh, that require more income. Uh, to expand their possibilities from here. No, we're talking about people that have friends, have families, have aspirations, uh, have roots, roots in their, their countries, their region. So these concrete people need to, to be, be brought to the space of policy making. And I think uh, uh, we have inspired, we have designed uh, social policy based on an old paradigm, the, the old welfare economics paradigm that emphasizes income, that thinks in terms of consumers, workers, producers, and not of human beings. And that's what we need to introduce to the new agenda. We're talking about human beings, not workers, not producers, not consumers, but human beings. Uh, maybe uh, 50, 70 years ago, the old paradigm, paradigm was working because that was a time of high growth rates. Um, countries in the second world war, uh, they were growing at six, seven percent. There was a lot of income. Um, we were not concerned about the environment. We were destroying the environment and we didn't care. In the 1960s, 1970s, there were some alarms, but in general, uh, countries kept uh, adding uh, CO2, uh, CO2 uh, carbon dioxide to the environment. So we didn't care about the environment. The, the planet was limitless at the time, no? And we didn't care also about the consequences of major uh, productivity transformations on human beings, uh, the consequences of well-being. So, so the idea was let's keep rising income, um, and this will provide better jobs, will provide um, better pensions, people with more income will enjoy a better life. That was the assumption. And now we are facing different conditions. Uh, in the 21st century, uh, we must forget about high economic growth rates. There are some countries like China uh, that are still growing at five, six, seven percent. But we know that the future will not be like the past in terms of economic growth rates. We know that the environment is something fragile. We need to, to, to be more concerned about the environment. And also there are awareness. There is awareness about the, the human limits of economic growth. Economic growth is also producing a lot of stress, a lot of uh, negative co competition. You, you have to compete with countries that pay very low wages, and you have to ask your workers, or look, uh, we cannot compete at these high wages. So you, you have to reduce this globalization is creating a push towards lower wages, more competition, more stress. So the, the future is not about uh, thinking about providing more income and using income uh, to provide well-being. We also know that income is not a major driver. It's one of the many drivers of well-being 
but not the unique driver. There are other drivers that are important. And this implies for policymakers that there are more instruments that can be used beyond income to generate working. And in economic terms, this means that we should be uh, concerned about how to use efficiently these resources. Um, it's not only about creating jobs, it's not only about uh, incorporating more people to the labor force, uh, it's about good jobs that are satisfying, you know, that people enjoy, that are part of their lives, that balance with their other parts. So I will talk more about jobs in my future intervention, but right now what I would like to say is that uh, we need to expand our vision we need to think in terms of uh, using efficiently these resources for social protection. Uh, resources will be scarce in the future because economic growth uh, will not be there. And we need to think in terms of providing well being to human beings rather than increasing jobs or increasing income. Uh, what do we find? We find that. Uh, health is very important. This is something everybody knows. Uh, but we know that uh, for well-being, we need to be concerned about mental health, not only physical health. Mental health is one of the main drivers of well-being. And uh, we need to introduce this in any agenda. We need to be concerned about interpersonal relations. Uh, people go through life with others. They join. Life is a journey uh, that you, you you go through life with other people. Usually, your family. In Latin America, your extended family, your cousins, aunts, uh, your friends, and these networks, not not working networks, but networks of friends, are very important. And some policies may be destroying these networks migration to, to get better jobs may be good for wages, but it's not good for your networks. These networks that provide a lot of well-being, a lot of sense to your life. So we need to incorporate this into the agenda. What is happening with these uh, family, uh, friendship networks when we are implementing policies that uh, aim at creating jobs, no? for example. Uh, the sense of community is important. Uh, and so we need to design better policies. And I think that that's the point here. There will not be many resources, economic resources in the future. Uh, the future does not look like the past in terms of availability of resources. Of course, there is concentration, and that's a, a major problem income concentration worldwide, but, but we need to be more efficient. And for that, we need to hold a people-centered perspective that goes beyond this welfare paradigm of consumers, producers, workers, uh, and to start thinking about human beings. Uh, and that's what subjective well-being can provide to, to this agenda, the design of more holistic uh, policies that uh, contribute more, are more efficient in increasing people's well-being. That, that, that is what I would like to say for the moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Mariano, for that, I think, very enriching perspective uh, in terms of what policymakers really need to think about when designing policies, seeing people as part of their families and communities and networks. And a sense of well-being. And I would think that the sort of issues that Olivia was raising about the risks of exclusion and the concerns that many social protection uh, policymakers have about, for example, the predictability of benefits, uh, the reliability of systems. I mean, all of that can also be seen as, in a way, reducing um, you know, that anxiety and mental stress that people have. If you know you can rely on a system that will be there if you lose your job, if you're sick, you know, if you have uh, if uh, you have an employment injury, 
So uh, one could also see that from, from that perspective, I think, of uh, mental health and well-being. If I can now turn to Romina, who's been uh, very quietly listening, uh, and to really try and stay with this issue of well-being that Mariano raised, uh, whether, however we, we capture it. Um, I, I want to know why should we also, as social protection actors, worry about uh, something that you and many others have been writing about and thinking about, these growing levels of income inequality in our societies that you know also intersect with many other uh, tenacious forms of what we call horizontal inequality, whether it's gender, whether it's in terms of race, migration status, and so forth. Why should why is this the kind of you know burning issue of the of the of the 21st century, um, and and why why is that important for this subjective sense of well being as well that Mariana was raising? Over to you, Robin. Thank you so much, Shara, and uh, well, good afternoon, good morning, all of you. Uh, first of all, many congratulations to the Inter American Conference on Social Security for this very very important. Uh, anniversary it's a pleasure to be here to celebrate it with you uh, indeed i think no matter how we define well-being uh, what we are realizing is that uh, the growing levels of inequality and the intersections uh, of income inequality with other forms uh, of uh, inequalities really are a problem uh, for for well-being of societies so let me elaborate a bit more uh, on on these issues with some concrete data uh, and then I will actually go back to the point that Olivier was very, uh, uh, you know, interestingly making about uh, the value of social protection and uh, social protection is a key investment that governments can make, any government of the world can make to actually reduce inequalities and improving uh, the lives uh, of, of people. Uh, first of all, uh, let me share uh, briefly uh, some findings from a report that we published last year uh, and that covered 11 uh, Latin American countries. And we were looking at how those countries actually had uh, developed uh, over the last couple of decades. It was very interesting to see that in many aspects of life, uh, looking at subjective well-being, but also more traditional social indicators, objective forms of well-being, uh, countries were developing. So we would see uh, quite impressive gains in aspects of development. development. However, what we uh, saw is that at the same time, in many of those countries, inequalities remain very, very large. And actually, that study predates and precedes actually the, the, the COVID-19 and the pandemic. And we all know how that uh, how that actually was bad for inequalities. But so before, even before the pandemic started, uh, we saw that while absolute poverty uh, had dropped from one in three uh, in 2006 to one in five in 2019, there was still 40% of people that were reporting to have high difficulties in that region to satisfy their needs with the family income. And that share was actually, uh, you know, edging up, started edging up in, in uh, since 2014. And we also documented that there was a significant and, and worsening gender component uh, when it comes to severe poverty and deprivation. Uh, so again, I'd like to share some of the key statistics uh, in 2019, for every 100 men living in poor households in the regions, there were at least 112 women in a similar situation. And that number was up from 105 in 2020, uh, 2002. In fact, uh, in those uh, 11 regions in the last, uh, in last uh, almost uh, a quarter of women, 24% of women have no income uh, of their own. So they have essentially access to no material resources within the households. Uh, if you look at income inequality, it has declined at the very beginning of the past two decades, but actually the pace of reduction has slowed since 2013 and, and, and uh, sorry, 2013, 2014, and it remains very high when compared to the OECD average. 81%, the very large fractions of Latin American respondents that we included in this study, were reporting that income distribution was unfair or very unfair. And that, of course, has affected very much uh, the way people have perceived fairness in their society and trust in their institution. Uh, if you look at things such as trust in government, support for democracy, tax morale, uh, they are all down from the 2000. 2000. Uh, and in fact, you know, we have data showing that tax morale really weakened in most of the countries that we included in the study. And of course, that uh, has a clear impact on the demand for redistribution and the support uh, the government, uh, you know, that, that citizens may expect from, from redistribution, if they see that the government is not effective, uh, they uh, will not necessarily, uh, you know, 
uh, demand uh, more help from the governments. So there is a, a vicious circle there, and uh, clearly, uh, you know, it is key to tackle that very vicious circle. Uh, as I also mentioned, uh, you know, the other problem of Nepal is not just they are uh, continuing to grow, it's also the fact that, uh, you know, they are compounded by many other factors in life. So if you look at things such as uh, women, children, uh, elderly youth, uh, the people uh, living in rural areas, the indigenous and the Afro-descendant people in the Lak region, but also the people with less education, they all tend to experience worse outcomes, uh, well-being outcomes, and fewer opportunities, especially when you look at, at living conditions. And actually, again, the, the, the statistics are quite staggering. Uh, if you look at the uh, absolute poverty rates of indigenous, they are nearly at twice as high as uh, you know, uh, among indigenous than in a non-indigenous population, and extreme poverty is three times higher. Uh, the similar, I think, type of gaps uh, are also observed when you look at the Afro-descendant people. So these are all very, very large divides that continue, uh, you know, to persist in the region. Uh, so even if uh, you know, we see that overall the pace of development in this Latin countries, uh, you know, uh, has been there for some time. There exists a number of challenges, especially when it comes, again, to the fairness uh, of the distribution of those outcomes. And so uh, a major part of the population, the Lac regions, uh, you know, continue to be held back. Uh, now, the issue with inequalities, and that was already quite clear in some of the interventions uh, of, in this panel, is that they're not just a problem morally. Of course, morally, they're a big problem. I mean, from a social justice perspective, they are a huge problem. They're actually also bad because they undermine the entire capacity of the societies to function. You know, this, they attack the social fabric, and it's very often also attack the very fundamentals in the uh, economy. So they really undermine the possibilities uh, of economies uh, so to prosper. And in fact, we have done a number of pieces of work in the OECD. I think now, probably since 15 years, we are publishing all sorts of different reports that says that countries that are more equal really fare better on average across uh, all well-being domains. And again, it doesn't matter if you define well-being in terms of subjective indicators or in terms of objective indicators, that correlation, that association is there and is, is very strong. So in general, uh, if you look at OECD countries such as, for instance, uh, the one in the Nordic countries, the Netherlands, New Zealand, and Switzerland, those tend to have greater equality between population groups, and you also tend to see in those countries fewer people living in the population, and uh, those countries really do well or no uh, type of well-being indicators. On the other hand, if you look at Eastern European, Latin American countries, but also Turkey and Greece, you will see that they do experience uh, uh, very deep inequalities and uh, at the same time, uh, lower levels the sort of current well-being. And so why and how does this evidence matter to social protection? Uh, it's very simple because social protection is the key instrument, is really the number one instrument to combat inequality. And so uh, the OECD was part, I think, of those international organizations that would say this is not just about redistribution if you want to make sure that the uh, you know, economy are uh, working in a fair way, or you want to make sure that you know, inclusive growth happens by design. That is true. And of course, there are many mechanisms that many policies that you have to enact and you know, implement to ensure that again, the design, but the by design mechanism is there. But it doesn't mean that, you know, you will actually give up to social protection. So definitely our message is very clear. You know, you start with social protection. Uh, let me, um, to conclude my first intervention, quote another report uh, on sustainable development goals. This is something we published just a couple of months ago, and it's an interesting study because it looks at the overall progress that countries, OECD countries made on SDGs uh, since uh, the agenda, the 2030 agenda was adopted back in 2016. So there we are documenting the progress across the SDGs targets. We have a very, very big data set. And we also did an exercise. We were looking at uh, uh, whether there was a good reason to explain why some countries actually uh, uh, are doing better on SDGs, you know, whether this is explained in any sort of possible way. And the interesting uh, finding that I can put here is that countries that uh, are the most advanced on SDGs target 1.3, which is the target on social protection systems for all, but also the target 10.4 on the breadth of uh, redistribution are, uh, you know, with no exceptions, the countries that have advanced the most on all of the sustainable development goals. So it seems that uh, really social protection is a key enabler of progress being made, not just on social, uh, aspects that is obviously clear and straightforward to understand. But as I said, there are also a number of payoff when it comes actually to the economy and even to the capacity of the country 
uh, to um, uh, you know to, to to manage the the environment uh, and uh, to be able to uh, you know use uh, resources in a responsible way. So our explanation is because social protection is not just key, uh, you know, to reduce inequalities and to uh, really help and support people and uh, in developing and thriving, but it's actually also a very very good mechanism for uh, making the system becoming more. Uh, resilient. So if you look at how Latin countries uh, perform uh, on the various social protection schemes, uh, there are still a number of gaps that needs to be filled. Uh, uh, Olivia was quoting some of the numbers. Uh, let me uh, perhaps here mention that, uh, first of all, not only there is a huge variation across the, uh, the, the Latin countries uh, the, in the, in the Latin regions to the, the extent to which they are providing uh, protection schemes to their uh, people, uh, but there are still a number that do not have any access to, for instance, 38% uh, of total workers in, in uh, the 11 black regions that we have analyzed do not uh, access to any kind of social protection, and 61% uh, of them, uh, of the regional workers, are in a form of employment. It means that they do not benefit from employment-related social protection programs such as pensions, paid annual leave, or sick leaves. Uh, I also should say that public social spending as a share of GDP has increased uh, in luck. It's now 8.6%, but it's still very much behind the OECD average of 21%. And the progress that we have seen here, again, is very much and even across countries. So in conclusion, we think inequality is a systemic weakness. Uh, the gains from effective redistribution can be huge. As a, a final piece of example, let me quote a study we did for G7. Uh, the G7 countries, where we actually demonstrated that the gain for redistribution uh, each year is equivalent to 13% of our other average annual income. So again, it's very, really, really large, and the, poor, the value of redistribution is uh, very large uh, and is visible in all countries uh, of this world. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Romina, for that very wide-ranging, uh, I think, elaboration of why Social protection is both important for inequalities and also how that has an impact not only on subjective well-being, but also some of the indicators that you were pointing to in terms of economic dynamism and also, as you mentioned, the whole issue around trust in institutions. And I would think the kind of uh, polarization and political tensions that can come from that. Um, let's just... I mean, you, you raise this issue of social protection being the most effective tool in addressing inequalities. Uh, but obviously, what happens in the labor market also matters a lot in terms of um, inequalities, you know, pre, pre redistribution and distribution in labor markets. Uh, let me now turn to Marcelo and also kind of to address that issue around uh, labor markets, important bearings on inequality and how in particular um, in, a, in, a, in a very changing and dynamic economic, um, economic context uh, where we have very diverse and sometimes new forms of work, how can we ensure that the social security system is actually being uh, and addressing uh, and providing coverage for people who are in very diverse forms of work? Olivia mentioned you know, the headline figure of 71% of the workforce being uh, in the world being informal and the growth of the informal economy, uh, uh, including uh, throughout this uh, COVID crisis. Uh, but how, how, how can we, what, what can we really uh, say and how can we ensure that the social protection systems become much more responsive in, in ways of being able to address the needs of a very diversified workforce? So over to you, Marcelo. Okay, so thank you very much. But as I see that there is simultaneous translation to Portuguese, I will take the opportunity to answer. I was preparing to answer it in Spanish, but as I said, that there is a simultaneous translation in Portuguese. I will speak in Portuguese. Bem, Shara, muitíssimo obrigado pela pergunta também. Muito obrigado. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sharon. Thank you. We'd like to thank this conference uh, to continue working. We continue working. I particularly can tell you that. I'm thankful to the General Secretary of the Seas. Thank you so much for working with us. Now, regarding the question that you've just asked, it's two-dimensional. Number one, you asked about coverage. The other dimension is correlated to the lack of fairness 
lack of like balance as we've mentioned it you know in that coverage but what would normally happen is the way we treat things and what we've observed is that the fact is if there's a subject that's working that's not i mean the work relations might be different maybe the person is working but not with a, a strong corporation but that person's working right he she starts to face difficulties uh, but uh, we have to think about coverage how to provide coverage we must have clearly identified the work i mean the groups of people that have it hard to obtain a benefit or coverage i mean there's social benefits social security and in correlation with human rights we need to identify those groups of our population that are difficult to cover we have to create a specific model for those people now for social security what we've observed is that there's four main groups i mean in the labor force there's these characterization first the first type of worker i mean we have to legislate draft laws for the rural sectors or people there's other countries that have that regulated there is another group of these four i mean there's uh like uh, workers that are in the middle type I mean, they're autonomous, they're just working. I mean, they're not, I mean, they're regulated, but they're not hired. I mean, contractually, maybe I were talking about lawyers, they were talking about doctors, that, you know, at some point they might decide that they don't want to be a member or affiliate themselves to social security services. But we're talking about other types of workers that are working in precarious conditions, a third group that makes it difficult for us to provide coverage are people who work at homes like um, maids or i mean it's very difficult to give them coverage because of the situation there's a fourth group that we've analyzed throughout the years there's subjects that work out in different platforms that work in some sort of digital platform like a like an uber or those uh, transportation systems now nowadays after a decade in the world we haven't defined clearly how to offer these subjects the proper coverage they're hired by these platforms by these digital hubs or platforms they're working in an autonomous way they're a group of workers or people i mean they're not employees but they're working for that third party it's like a hybrid subject i mean that's part of what's surged at amidst this time i want to mention the differences and what we see i mean we see different levels there's sme small and medium-sized enterprises there's all types of companies in in this stratigraphy i mean we've seen so many changes in the globe in the planet if we talk about technology social changes everything's changing the relations between workers and others i mean change throughout time the first thing we must do is legislate defined by legislating to provide coverage to those specific groups these are just barely the minimum requirements we need to regulate just enough we need to start by defining in our laws and regulations the specific subjects or groups who are they what are the types i mean we have to be very thorough drill down to detail we can have subjects in group a b c and d etc but i'd like to have a list of all the subjects of people who are working in different fields but what we need to do is to detail the types of subjects naturally with a decision in our legislation process we have to consider correlating innovation to subjects administration and its issues we have to find solutions because a lot of people don't even know that have access to benefits, to services, 
to all of these services. They don't know they have access. What's important now is that we must be transparent when we communicate to the population, explain they have benefits, explain the administration and management of things. There's a lot of paperwork that's sometimes too complex that needs to be simplified. There's technology that's an instrument, that's a tool that gives us or helps us provide full coverage or access to the users of the benefits. We can pay our telephone, we can pay our telephone plan, or there's updates and upgrades with our cell phones. We have to be very careful when administrating things. We don't want to put ourselves in a situation in which we're excluding subjects or people because of the digital situation. That's that's something that will lead us to the lack of equality. We have to be very care careful when building these systems for social security. These systems, I mean, it's not, it's a system that should not intensify the lack of equality in our societies. There's a natural trend. The natural trend is that the lack of equality can replicate. Let's not go, f let's not fall back to the past. There is a lot of work. Historically, I know that we've created options for benefits. Yes, time has passed by. But the systems that work for Social Security sometimes don't give or can't standardize and, and give full coverage. And we have to be careful with what we do. There's thresholds. There's limits. We have to leverage things. We know that the Social Security seen as a system can contribute to eliminate the lack of fairness or equality. We offer security for our seniors, for women, for the disabled or abled. Thank you for your attention. Um, thanks very much, Marcelo. And I want to stay a little bit with that theme that you mentioned. Uh, uh, employment injuries or sickness uh, and so forth. So for that working age population, what does a sort of well-being research say that we should be looking out for uh, in terms of the needs of that of that kind of, uh, of that age group, that middle age group, not not yet children, not older persons, but the working age population. If you could just point to a few findings from uh, from your research, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I've made the argument that um, we need to, to, to follow a people-centered approach. Uh, and this means that when we're talking about uh, jobs, when we're talking about this adult population, uh, we must keep in mind that they are not only workers. They are persons, many of them have family. You know, I'm very aware of the trends in Europe uh, of uh, declining uh, birth rates. Uh, of course, that's related to, to working policies, policies in the uh, labor sector. Uh, but in general, we, we need to keep in mind that we are talking about persons that have more domains in life than work. Uh, and I think this is important because usually we talk about creating jobs. And what we need to do is to create good jobs uh, and to think in terms of a uh, good job. So what is a good job? A good job is not only uh, a job that provides uh, a, a salary, um, that, that basic phrase of how do you make a living, no? uh, uh, how much money you, you earn in that work. No? Uh, we must understand that um, this working for these adults, uh, these jobs are part of their life. It's a vital space. Um, we go through life and we have jobs, we have families, we have friends, we have hobbies, and that makes our well-being. Our well-being comes from all these parts, but they are interconnected. What happens in the labor sector, in the labor domain, 
uh, affect what happens in families. And so when we talk about good jobs, it's the good job for you and the good job for those who surround you. And this is something that I think we are neglecting when we think about jobs. It's about what happens with the family. What happens with these little kids, adolescents, that are growing with no parents at home? Uh, we say social protection can provide uh, nurseries for these people. But let's be clear, and that's something we find uh, in our research. Nurseries can provide care, but not love. They are not good substitutes of love. Uh, and the love that comes from grandparents, the love that comes from, from mothers, fathers, uncles, that kind of growing up, families growing up um, together, uh, that's part of a good job the possibility to not only make a living, but raise a family. And that's something very important. And I stress this argument because this is what makes Latin America special. Uh, good extended families. And um, if we care only about providing jobs that pay good salaries, we may be destroying other relevant drivers of well-being in Latin America. Uh, of course, we will have more income. Uh, we will have income if both members of the, of the family uh, integrate into the labor market, they, there will be more income. And I've seen cases where people get out of poverty because uh, the, the couple gets jobs and they have incomes above the poverty line. But that makes also other domains of life more difficult, especially what is happening with little kids growing up in these uh, households where there are no adults present during the day. Uh, nurseries are not good substitutes of love. They provide care, but not love. So that's very important when we talk about good jobs. Of course, it's very important also to, to consider the stress, the conditions. It's not only about salary, but about the quality of the workplace. And there is a lot of literature on what makes a workplace of good quality. You know? Of course, shifts are very important, working shifts. Um, the conditions to relate with co-workers. I've seen cases where people don't know each other just as instrumental uh, relations, but not uh, genuine relations where you care. Your co-workers are your friends. That's something that does not happen a lot in many countries. You go to work, you make a living, you get a salary and go back to your apartment. No, we need to recognize that this is a vital space. People spend eight hours per day, five days a week, in some countries even six days a week. And these are part of their life. So the main question is what makes a job a satisfying one and what makes this job important, not only for the person, but also for the surrounding family. Let's face it, Many people have family, and I would say that I would like also for those who do not have time, because there are a lot of pressures, to, to reduce this pressure so they can enjoy more life. Um, we have emphasized productivity, and leisure does not come there, because leisure is not measured in the GDP. So that's something we must also incorporate when we talk about good jobs. I think that subjective well-being research uh, provides, as I said, uh, when we ask people about their satisfaction with life, their satisfaction uh, with working conditions, we are asking human beings, not workers. And so the answer provides information not only about what happens in the job, working place, but also what happens in their lives as a whole. And that's very useful to, to make good policies in this sector. Let's not forget families, 
let's not forget that it's not only about salaries, but more important, about a sense of purpose, a sense of competence, that you say, uh, I'm appreciated by colleagues, by friends, I have friends there, no, and I have good relations with boss, my boss, and so on. So these kind of conditions need to be incorporated into the agenda. Uh, and stress those parts, not only the salaries, uh, that's not so important uh, according to subjective well-being research. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mariano, for bringing in again your very refreshing sort of perspective on things that reminding us about the sort of embeddedness of people within social relations, within families, within communities. But if I can also say, if, I mean, having those kind of quality services, of course, uh, they can't be loving, they can be caring. They are not supposed to substitute for family, but to complement family. And, um, and, and for many people, it gives a degree of autonomy. I mean, uh, as, for example, an older person, we may want to think that we're not dependent on our family members and we can have services uh, for our care when we get old in order to um, also liberate family members. So I think there's a very nice discussion there to be had. But again, thank you very much for your very rich perspective. And if I want to now uh, again turn to Romina, if I can, about going back to the issue of inequality again. Um, and, uh, and really, I mean, this issue that uh, Mariano was raising also about time poverty, there is also a, a, an, an inequality uh, dimension to it, you know. Uh, very long hours of work uh, for people with very low incomes is a very different thing to, I don't know, long hours of work for people who are working in the finance sector and earning huge incomes. So again, the question of inequality comes into it. Um, so if I can just ask you about these high levels of inequality that um, also we know have uh, risks in terms of slowing down poverty reduction, uh, they undermine social mobility and the chance for people to move up the social ladder, they can contribute to um, the intergenerational transmission of poverty and disadvantage, which really goes against this idea of equality of opportunity. Uh, so what is the role of social protection here in being able to really uh, put the task of uh, mitigating the transmission of inequalities across generations and breaking that transmission and trying to create a more level playing field, a real kind of equality of opportunity? for people. Uh, if, if you could address that question, that would be very nice. Thank you. Yes, thank you. I, I think that uh, that question allows me actually to spell out yet another reason why inequality is bad. Is, and this is because you know, it, it really transmits over time. And so inequality today means more inequality tomorrow. And again, you know, we have demonstrated that with, with a lot of data. But why it matters as well for governments, because they obviously do operate in an environment where you know, resources are scarce, where they have, you know, a number of challenges, you know, mounting, et cetera, et cetera. And so they really have to concentrate on the smartest in a way, on the, on the best investment they could possibly make. And so uh, our work uh, has shown that uh, really the key to uh, combating and mitigating transmission of inequalities across generations is to invest in people and actually do uh, that as early as possible. So that means clearly investing in children and families. And you know, we've done studies that shown that this is the most uh, you know, cost-efficient uh, approach for uh, public policies, the best way to ensure that people you know, can be happy, healthy, uh, and you know, live meaningful lives. So it's not just about, again, the economic sort of payoff, but it's also you know, the entire sort of well-being benefits that that type of investment sort of brings about. Uh, let me go back to the study that I mentioned that we did in the 11 uh, Latin American countries. Uh, in 2019, uh, one third of children uh, aged between zero and 14 were living in absolute uh, uh, income poverty levels. Uh, and that compares, you know, so this 31% compared with 17% uh, uh, for the people aged 25, 54. So you can see that, you know, the prevalence of absolute uh, income poverty is much, much larger in among the families which uh, young children. Uh, the other issue, of course, that is still, uh, you know, one of, uh, uh, obviously, 
uh, that comes with, with a lot of worries for us and concern is that uh, there is still quite a lot of uh, paid uh, child labor in the, in the region. It's 5% of children aged between 10 and 14 uh, that are employed uh, according to the latest data that we could uh, sort of gather. And uh, this issue, so the prevalence of uh, child labor is higher uh, among the indigenous communities, uh, especially for children in mid teens. Uh, and in those you know, groups, uh, those uh, levels of ch child uh, labor reach uh, between 30% uh, percent and 43% uh, in, um, in the countries that we look uh, into. So depending on the country you're considering, you, know, you can find so the 30% or even 43% of uh, teenager uh, being employed uh, you know, with forms of, of child, uh, sort of uh, paid child labor. Uh, so uh, the, the other issue with the, uh, childhood disadvantage is that it's not only something you see when it comes to economic sphere, uh, but in fact, uh, the disadvantage uh, and, you know, the being left behind is something really that stretches across all dimensions of well-being. So that actually includes uh, a lack of basic food and nutrition, poor health outcomes, uh, you know, worse performance in education, but also things such as, you know, uh, poor social and emotional outcomes, the support that is being given uh, from the family, because just the families obviously don't have the time or the resources to be able you know, to support the children, uh, lower self-esteem and lower life satisfaction. These are all things that we do observe in children coming from disadvantaged um, backgrounds. And of course, you know, this is not just the fault of the parents, you know, the, but the whole environment, you know, the whole neighborhood and everything that surrounds those parents is actually not being set up uh, in a way that allows, you know, those families to help uh, their children uh, doing well. Uh, so what we are saying very simply is that, you know, the investment in children should start early and actually even before children are, uh, you know, uh, uh, children are there. So we should start really with the, the pregnancy. So we're looking at into the mothers to break out the, the cycle of disadvantage. But it's not just, you know, the investing in the early uh, uh, here's, uh, you know, in many, many OECD countries uh, today, you have something, programs called the, the first thousand days of life. These are very interesting programs. Uh, definitely OECD supports those type of approaches because, again, the focus is that, you know, in the very first years of lives uh, of children, uh, the government spent a lot, you know, not just in terms of money, but really in effort in time to sort of secure the healthy living conditions. But it's not enough. So it's also important to make sure that this effort and this investment is really maintained throughout the entire childhood and uh, the adolescence of children it takes obviously in the form of investment in schools uh, and education but also uh, mental and physical health and mental and physical health was the other i would say big big or sort of the deterioration of, of mental physical health was the other big consequences of the pandemic. Uh, we do stress, you know, in terms of what are the best tools uh, for intervening and so for investing in children and families, we do insist on social benefits. We think that social benefits have an important uh, role to play in reducing child poverty. We have done a very interesting study in OECD that shows that um, the per capita social expenditures uh, has increased in recent decades. Uh, and in particular, the social expenditures that is uh, given to families, and that growth in spending has coincided with a reduction in child poverty. And the elasticity, actually, so you know, the impact of that increase in the expenditure is pretty significant because uh, one percent increase in per capita social expenditures was actually found to be associated with a one percent uh, reduction uh, in the relative. Uh, child uh, poverty rates. Uh, the other aspect, of course, that we are stressing, I'm sure that ILO has a very, very uh, sort of um, similar or position that is aligned to ours is the importance of providing a stable uh, full-time parental employment. Uh, this is key uh, to uh, protect children from poverty. Uh, and so that actually means, we go back to the point, I think that uh, Mariano was raising about child care services. Uh, let us not forget that, you know, uh, putting in place an affordable child care service, service is also important to be able, you know, to, I mean, to provide opportunities to both parents uh, to, uh, to work. Um, and of course, uh, it's not just, uh, you know, what we are providing in terms of sort of work assistance, but also all the type of services, you know, in the health uh, and, and social sort of spheres that are essential for families you know, to be able, you know, to, uh, to, to, to reconcile sort of work, uh, and uh, private life in a way that can also be supportive of the needs uh, of the children. 
I wanted perhaps to also, uh, if I have the time, uh, give an example of the type of strategies to type to tackle child poverty uh, and policies also that have proved effective in terms of reducing the uh, sort of intergener uh, intergenerational transmission of poverty. Uh, going back to the point of targeting that Olivia was making uh, a little earlier, uh, one of the policy advice that we give to uh, countries in this respect is actually to have an approach that uh, combine universal policies with uh, additional policies that aim um, at uh, improving the well-being of uh, children uh, and also vulnerable solution. So it's not exactly you know, the issue of targeting versus non-targeting, but it looks a bit at that question. So what we're saying is that on the one hand, we need a sort of a floor that uh, involves universal services for all children, and that universal services uh, sort of uh, provision needs to be developed in a way that is as inclusive as, in pos as possible. Uh, so you want to make sure, of course, that you are addressing all types of different inequalities uh, and make sure that all children can have uh, through that type of services isn't the standard of living. Um, but uh, it's not just about those good quality universal public services, it's also to also come with a very specific tailored support uh, to uh, the most vulnerable uh, households. And so also having this uh, additional services being provided um, you know, top of mainstream provision to the ones that need uh, uh, very special services uh, the most. And so I think it's it's really where we sort of strike the balance between having a, self, a sort of a provision of services that is universal in nature, but at the same time is able to meet the specific additional needs of the most disadvantaged households. Um, of course, it's not just what you do with families, even if I wanted just to focus those ones, because for us are of primary importance. Uh, there are a number of other social protection measures that are important to boost uh, social mobility and, and in particular to help and protect the position of the middle class. Uh, we've done some work in the LAC region, for instance, that was looking at the issues of segmented social assistance and social insurance programs. Uh, and this is, of course, this type of issues become even more important in a context that is shaped by uh, some uh, big technological shift, as we just also heard from uh, Marcelo, but also climate shifts, and not least the COVID-19 crisis. So one of the perhaps reflections to made in that respect is that, of course, the temptation of government is to sort of intervene and respond, you know, when the new so crisis or the new shock, shock sort of comes in. Uh, but of course, it is also important to keep a structural vision of uh, what needs to be offered. Again, I think this is one of the points that Olivia was making before. It's not just responding, you know, to the sort of uh, to the shock that is important, but it's also making sure that we understand sort of the broader uh, evolution uh, of the society and the type of requirements that this puts on social protection systems. We want to make sure that again the coverage uh, is universal, is broad, and also deep enough, and really sort of reaches out uh, to. Uh, many. Um, so, um, final, final thought from my side to say that again, if you just compare uh, the levels uh, of social benefits, social protections, again, not just for families, but for all type of uh, individuals and households. So, if you compare that level of equity of benefits, uh, you know, uh, of the LAC regions with the uh, levels uh, provided in OECD countries, we do see that the adequacy of benefits remains a big challenge in the LAC region. So it means that the LAC regions is definitely not spending enough, uh, not as much as they should, at least if they want to catch up with the OECD uh, countries. And uh, again, uh, the other point here is to put in place uh, strategies for combating informality. Uh, and uh, that is also obviously positive, possibly for improving the tax basis uh, you know, that can be good for making uh, those type of social protection investments in the future. Great, thank you very much. And if I can just maybe add one uh, point that came from research on child benefits mm -hmm. that uh, ILO has been doing with UNICEF. What we showed is that in countries that currently don't have universal child benefits, with these simulations that were done, show that with a, you know, with a universal child benefit scheme that would cost about 1% of GDP, they would actually be able to reduce child poverty rates by as much as 20%, you know, which has significant implications for child labor as well. So another very good reason for why, you know, there needs to be investment in at least having this kind of floor of universal child benefits on which there is quite, quite a lot of evidence. So if I can now, uh, I think we're coming right to, uh, we're still keeping within time, I believe. Um, 
And I want to turn to Marcelo now, because in a way, um, Olivier also uh, started uh, his uh, keynote address by talking about the way in which the multilateral system uh, is perhaps not serving uh, sufficiently uh, the needs of countries, uh, particularly those that have huge financing gaps and need to make uh, much stronger investments in their social protection systems. Uh, so I want to turn to uh, Marcelo and really ask about, you know, as a being sitting on in ISA, how do you see the role of the multilateral system in terms of supporting social security institutions um, to be able to better cope with many of the kind of shocks that, uh, you know, we seem to be in now with climate change, with um, pandemics um, and other global challenges that we're facing? How do you see uh, you know, uh, Olivia talked about the international financial system, but what about the rest of the multilateral system? How do you see uh, the role of us in, in supporting countries in being able to build the kind of social security systems that they, that they need in a, in a world with so many covariate shocks? Veja, neste caso, eu julgo que é muito do ponto de vista de fornecer orientações em como construir uma sociedade. Em como construir uma sociedade particular considerando o mindset da segurança social. E quando falamos sobre a existência para o setor de choque, Let me tell you about the situation of the climate expectations. How is that social security could decrease this climate problem in the life of people? Something that comes and that exists, for example, and we have a flood and the people that are involved with them and those that are directly involved, it can be something that decreases the effect and the benefits of Social Security, that it's an association which members are the institutions that implement or place the policies of social security and in their own work, for example, our members more must consider the ecological impact, the ecological footprint that generates for the system as a whole. In the weather of the, like in the state of the procedures that they are using. And this important situation is that several of the Institutes of Social Security have a lot of money and some that don't have for their investment. And then when we make the investment decisions, we could or we should make these investment decisions considering environmental aspects, but not only environmental, but also every situation that exist at present in the governance and social securities and questions. But with environmental impacts, we must consider the investments of this social security and also the environmental impacts and the other mindset of resilience. There are other shocks or uh, economic impacts, public health impacts, like for example, in pandemic. I want to start by saying that this matter is very clear, it's very important for the association. We ourselves are launching a new directive guideline in our yearly forum that says exactly and talks exactly about the continuity of businesses in the institutions that implement the policy of social security and besides, this will be another topic for us. So with pandemic of COVID-19, and as they showed us, the systems of social security are fundamental. They have a crucial role in the uh, population in crisis moments that is more complicated. In this sense, the system of social security, it's a fundamental piece for the 
resilient society <clears throat> demanding the system of social security or services. And for this, from the administrative mindset, it's also important that this social security institutions will have an institutional preparation through an institutional capacity that will allow them to generate or elaborate very fast the answers and to implement new programs. And for this, we have to work a lot with the innovation in administration. Digitalization is important and also flexibility, a good governance likewise, and also like having qualified staff and with constant uh, qualification. I do not have any doubt that the systems of social security contribute with resilience. In the meantime, that some systems that are better than others. So COVID had some lessons for us to this respect. As I was saying, uh, systems of institutions that have an institutional preparation that present a greater capacity of resilience and to adjust to different situations. They have a greater resilience and the coverage of the society and social security also offers a greater resilience for society as a whole. So the countries where there was or is a greater coverage, they had a better resilience where the autonomous workers, the independent workers, have great difficulties of coverage that were less resilient in the impact of pandemic and the countries that had a wider coverage and also which are the benefits that they offer. So in order for social, sec <coughs> social security to control, we have to have an administration and a coverage of social security even wider. And to finish, what I want to tell you is that resilience demands resources, budget resources that is uh, costly. We saw that pandemic was very costly for the governments. It was a lot for the systems of social security, so then we have to respond how we can finance these measures with other crises that appear without notifying us. They come all of a sudden, and we're talking about the world and a society that is with crisis every 30 or 40 years and how to face them if we observe changes, very fast and radical changes. We have to know how to react also very fast to these modifications that are radical, to think in a policy of social security, which can widen this uh, social security in times of crisis, and that it will talk about social security in stronger times. It's a possibility. We have seen this for several decades with a fiscal policy. Social security, it's a little bit different, but it's a way to take a perspective, a different perspective from social security. It's important that we say that in order to form this resilience, we need to form a resilience exactly in the period that we're not in crisis. Where there's no crisis, we have the ability of encouraging them integrating systems and to invest in an adequate administration and to accumulate something in terms of financing for the p crisis p periods which are stronger. Panelists uh, for having done so. 
and maybe uh, it's good to um, have maybe each of you spend a minute just if there are any other burning issues that you would like to raise uh, at this point before I hand over to Olivier for his closing remarks, having heard uh, all, of, all of the reflections that came from your responses to the questions. Um, if there are any issues that you would like to raise at this point, um, I would like to give you the chance for any closing remarks before I hand over to Olivier. Uh, so um, without wanting to put you on the spot, I don't know, Mariano, uh, Romina, if you would like to come in with any, any issues uh, that you would like to raise, any highlights based on what you heard. Um, yeah. No, 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 no further reflections. Okay, it must be getting late. And uh, therefore, let me now uh, hand over to Olivier for any uh, closing remarks that uh, he will have, uh, uh, having heard the panel. And again, reflecting on what you said, uh, Olivier, in your keynote address, we look forward to your uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Well, many thanks, uh, Shara, and let me thank you, all the panelists, for, I think, very stimulating comments that led us to explore territories we probably had not anticipated we would be um, exploring in this discussion, given the way the, the panel was framed. Um, I would like to, to, to say the following. We have traditionally been used to speaking about social protection, social security, um, based on a very simple idea that we needed to increase monetary wealth, in other terms, grow the economy, and then redistribute whatever wealth is created in order to um, support um, uh, workers and their families, and in order to reduce the inequalities that result from market relationships. So that was a compensatory approach um, to um, social protection that um, essentially relies on the idea that growth is an indispensable ingredient and in the Fordist compromise, you know, one third of the wealth created goes to the state in the form of taxes, one third goes to workers in the form of higher wages as productivity increases, and then one third um, roughly goes to the shareholders of, of the companies dominating the economy. Now, this idea is increasingly problematic. We know that the pursuance of growth is more and more difficult. In other terms, it's less and less realistic to be able to count on continued high levels of growth to finance social protection, to meet increasing social needs. We also know that this search for growth has had sometimes exclusionary impacts, um, leading to choices in areas such as um, the creation of a friendly business climate, um, uh, trade policies, investment policies that have had problematic impacts on people in poverty and on low-income um, households, that unfortunately the search for growth very often has led major economic actors to be able to translate their economic dominance into political influence because they were the champions of mass production for mass consumption. And it has also led, in many cases, to a rise in inequalities within countries, um, justified by uh, the need for growth. You know, the link is, for example, more flexible labor regulations. And the risk, of course, of these rising inequalities is that they create a vicious cycle described very well, I think, by Romina Boarini, um, referring or alluding to the great Gatsby curve in which more inequality means fewer um, uh, life opportunities for those at the bottom and less social mobility. Uh, so a perpetuation of inequalities from one generation to the next. So this model, of growth as a precondition for everything else becomes problematic. And for us, um, advocates of social protection, um, defenders of the human right to social security, it is a real challenge. So there are two ways to address this challenge. One is to say, we need not only to work on 
compensatory social protection, right, the, the post-market redistribution, we also need to work on an inclusive economy, free market distribution and create opportunities for all to thrive as productive economic agents, for example, by strong non-discrimination requirements in, in, in the employment market, um, by um, right to lifelong training and so on, to ensure that no one is you know, excluded from the economy so that we will have less to compensate for. The other approach is, is the one I believe Mariano is challenging, challenging us to think about. It is how to reinvent social protection in a post-growth economy, in what Herman Daly calls the stationary economy. And there's a growing body of work um, on this, uh, although it's not um, really mature yet, emphasizing that, for example, reduced working time should really be part of our inclusive society that protects everyone from exclusion. Um, reduced working time that uh, can have positive gender impacts in particular by reducing what some authors have called competitive presenteeism in which you are promoted in your firm because you stay long hours, which women find more difficult to do than men. Um, although it is not always automatically the case that uh, tasks within the household will be automatically redistributed as a result of reduced working hours. But that is part of this post-growth economy we are trying to invent. Or another component is, of course, reducing inequalities, right? By imposing, for example, limits on the gap between the, the lowest uh, earners within a firm and the highest earners, right? Which have been widening so much, particularly in, um, in Anglo-American countries. And, or a third component is consumption patterns that should be made more sustainable and respond to a norm of sufficiency rather than a norm of um, social competition and the search for social status by conspicuous consumption. Or to take a fourth example, um, the decommodification of services such as childcare services in order to make sure that fewer things we need to lead a decent life will depend on the purchasing power we have, right? And and if we decommodify services such as childcare, um, the impact of income inequalities will be less important and the competition to um, uh, be paid more between workers will be, will be less damaging for our mental health and indeed for the environment. So I think um, this um, challenge that we are presented with to think beyond incomes about well-being and to incorporate sustainability also in the sense of planetary boundaries that we should not exceed in rethinking social protection is really something we, we, we must devote more energy to. Um, um, it is the topic of my current work and I, 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 I very much believe it is uh, the next frontier of our uh, reflections on the future of social protection. So I would like to thank you all for your very stimulating comments that I think give us the tools to move in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olivier. And we look forward to your um, forthcoming reports on the themes that you just highlighted, uh, breaking these new uh, frontiers in uh, the research on extreme poverty and the role of social security systems, social protection. And I would like to, before thanking our panelists and thanking you for a very stimulating discussion, also end on a note that the idea of social protection and social security was also based on the concept of the frailty of all human beings, not on the idea of a rational economic man, which is so strongly embedded within the thinking on economic growth and GDP. The idea of social security is about human frailty throughout the life cycle and the need for solidarity and community in being able to really build systems that can create the kind of redistribution that we need and the solidarity that we need between those who are doing well economically and those who are less economically fortunate, between women and men, between those who are at that moment sick and those who are healthy. So the idea of mutual insurance and social security, I think, is based on that sense of well-being and community 
that, um, that was being uh, addressed by several of our speakers and not about this atomistic, um, you know, economic man in pursuit of GDP. So I remain hopeful that uh, with new kind of thinking and new conditions that in which social security systems are based, we can, we can really make sure that uh, we do uh, rise to the challenge of a world that is not driven by GDP growth, but really by a sense of expanding human freedoms, expanding capabilities, as Amartya Sen calls it, expanding human well-being, and really basing that on this concept of uh, social solidarity uh, and, and mutual insurance. So on that note, let me thank you, uh, all of you, for your participations. I really would like to, again, thank Olivier for his very stimulating uh, keynote address. I also want to thank uh, Mariano, Romina, and Marcelo for having uh, responded to the questions and having uh, really given uh, the panel the richness that it had. And again, wishing uh, a very, very happy 80th birthday uh, for the Inter-American Conference on Social Security, CISS, uh, and, and wishing uh, all the participants, all the listeners, as well as the organizers, uh, a very uh, good rest of uh, today and uh, a very good conference uh, in, in, the, in the coming days. Thank you uh, and have a nice uh, afternoon, have a nice evening. Uh, and a nice uh, lunch uh, for colleagues in Mexico and Latin America. And thank you, thank you, uh, Sara, for a very, uh, very good uh, moderating role. And we are very happy to to have all of you participating in this in this uh, inauguration panel of the um, 80th anniversary of our conference of social security. So thank you all, and a special greeting on behalf of our uh, CIS Secretary General uh, to each one of you, and particularly to Mr. Marcelo Caetano, who's the Secretary General of our global sister organization, the International Association of Social Security. Obrigado, Marcelo. Uh, so um, thank you, everyone, and then um, uh, we wish to call out, to keep on collaborating with each one of you, and uh, feel free to join us also in our next uh, during our next session on the response of the American Social Security Systems vis-à-vis uh, -vis the COVID-19 pandemic. In our view, our analysis, the CIS analysis on the balance a year. Uh, uh, you know, after uh, more than a year uh, then, um, of, of this uh, emergency. So, so thank you to our panelists. I think we can, we can give them a round of applause. Um, from this auditorium in Mexico City. So thank you, thank you really. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And then, Tambain, I think we have the same link for this coming, the upcoming session. Uh, am I correct? Uh, so if we do have the same link, I would only tell our public to stay tuned uh, for the beginning of this uh, uh, new session. Uh, will be, it will be moderated by my colleague, uh, Ingrid Picasso. And uh, so just a uh, um, breve anuncio para o público que está a nos acompanhar um, do Brasil, uh, que uh, o canal em português para vós uh, continuar a nos acompanhar é na rede, no Facebook. Então, só continuem conosco para a próxima sessão, uh, a resposta dos sistemas americanos de segurança social. Uh, the boys are pandemic. In the social security and then after pandemic of COVID-19. The balance to my colleague uh, Ingrid Picasso for this uh, se session starting now. Thank you.
uh, that's the response to Social Security in the system. So we're balancing out a mess, like one year balance. We're listening to Alvaro Velar Hernandez to initiate this panel. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Uh, we thank you all. Th we greet you on behalf of Soy Rodoboredo Aburto, President of the Inter-American Conference on Social Security. We welcome you all to the presentation of the booklet series, which is the response of the social security system to the COVID-19 pandemic. It's one year balance. So for us, it's an enormous pleasure to introduce a set of booklets starting this week in which we're celebrating the 80th birthday or anniversary of this conference. Since we started, you know, closing or shutting down the economy of non-essential activities in the American continent due to the spread of COVID-19 in 2020, it was clear to us that social security services and systems had to execute their job, which is relevant to avoid the spread, the accelerated spread of SARS-CoV-2 and to mitigate the consequences in our societies and in our economics amidst the pandemic. Those of us who were working in the social security field or in this sector, we were expecting the response of our systems amidst the emergency. It, it was so heterogeneous, you know, and our systems work that way in social security in the Americas. Now, when we speak of coverage, structure, financing, you know, amidst the emergency, the CIS or this conference analyzed social security services in the American continent. This analysis generated the booklet series of research that was created in 2020. We analyzed the Brazilian cases, Canada, Chile, and Equator. A year after, we planned a program that's very ambitious to analyze the responses of the social security systems and response mechanisms. We created a series of booklets, which are 10. We analyzed Colombia, Trinidad, Tobago, Belize, Peru, Equator, El Salvador, Republic, and Dom Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, and Mexico. There's another set of booklets that are still under development in which we analyze the Canadian and Brazilian cases. We kicked off this project, and it's the response of different interests. We wanted to identify what we took to practice effectively in our societies to understand the catastrophic effects of the pandemic, understanding back then that the pandemic and the creation of these booklets could strengthen the response amidst the pandemic and to get up and running and ready systematically amidst the threat. In this booklet series, we want to for formulate the responses when we question what can we learn amidst the pandemic, what did we learn as a response? The panel members of the executive unit of research will give us the response. They're part of the general secretariat of this conference. The social security systems protected the populations of the effect in the emergency crisis. With institutional practice, we strengthened the broad and broadened the coverage of those who are under the scheme of coverage or not, we transferred and analyzed, um, you know, what happened with our people who were affected by the virus and didn't have the means, those who were in confinement or isolated, and there was non-essential closure of all our activities. Now, we trust that this booklet series are useful for all the state members, for uh, government agencies, multilateral entities, unions, labor unions, NGOs, research centers, universities, and any other agency or entity correlated or that works for social security. I think for all the partners, allies that are working with us and the member states and with the ministries of health and safety, monitoring agencies, universities, research centers. We thank you all. Thank you for sharing and contributing with your information, with your data. You gave us the preliminary reports with our part of the information that's contained in the booklets. Thank you for the feedback. We had the works, the development, the dialogues in which we analyze the response amidst the pandemic as social security institutes. This happened on the 23rd of August of 2021. Thank you for being part of that session and of this important session. Thank you for being present remotely or in the auditorium. The word is now for the moderator, Ms. Ingrid Picasso. She's in charge of the implementation of this efforts from the executive unit of research in this entity. Thank you. Thank you for being part of this body. Good afternoon.
Thank you so much. Well, we'll continue. First of all, could you just um, share the slideshow? Next slide, please. Amidst the pandemic, with SARS-CoV-2, we declared the health crisis in 2020 during March by WHO and all the economies. We Im Im had the measures in place to to stop the spread and avoid having our citizenship being affected. It's important for us to mention before this that SARS-CoV-2 has impacted our lives at a personal level and at households in all layers in our communities, in the collective. We have focused then and questioned the way in which we work at home and in other areas. We analyzed the dynamism of how we're ordered in the world we understood that there is a lack of fairness in our continent and our social security structures in this continent. It's, it's like a, the way we're constituted is very heterogeneous in social security and the order or structure of things. How are we sustaining things with social security as a bedrock? There is administrators, agencies that provide services that lend them. There's institutional architectures, right? And there's structure. There's financing sources and levels of coverage. This allowed us to, based on assumptions, give the right response amidst the pandemic. The responses were different, and it's important to know them. The, what we're going to share with you today has a clear objective. We want to study how heterogeneous was the practice amidst the pandemic in different social security systems. We protected the populations amidst the emergency crisis, amidst the economic social crisis that was caused by coronavirus. Now, we dedicated ourselves to study what happens in the healthcare, in the economics. We try to stop the spread. Uh, people were confined during 40 days. We had to see and award some budget to those in their retirement years or elders. There are some agencies or companies that close, SMEs close, shut down. And there were some activities that weren't considered essential, and those positions were halted at some point in the first stage of the pandemic. There were some benefits for some people in vulnerable conditions. And amidst COVID and its spread, we saw that healthcare workers or first responders were out there, people in janitorial positions and other other jobs were created. There's services or benefits or coverage due to maternity leave. There were some benefits given to some people that are disabled or have other conditions. There's people that suffer the, sequ the consequences of COVID-19, so they're disabled to execute their task now. There's people, that, the diseased, obviously, that made us trigger mechanisms to provide as much coverage. We acknowledge all the, the effect in our immediate circles. These are points that are correlated to all the layers of Covenant 102 of the IOT or ILO or LIO. They can see in the screen, we can see all those instruments in the healthcare issues. There is an incremental rate in violence at the household. There was a gap that instead of narrowing, it grew um, when uh, job opportunities were offered to women and equal opportunities. Women, we analyzed a set of uh, editorial documents that were published about women's capacity to work in Chile, Peru, Par Paraguay, Mexico, and Spain. These were books written by local authorities, government officials, ministries, senators, amongst others. You can analyze what was uploaded as content in our webinars and YouTube about how we took care systematically with a method. And people used uh, digital means or platforms, you know. Um, and we also had to really consider those who are even, uh, you know, picking up our trash in landfills. Uh, my colleagues at Devi documented page after page of internet or interfaces. They analyzed in this research center, all of that documented. They had their interviewees based in different countries. They were interviewers, and as our secretary already mentioned, our researchers obtained feedback, comments, or outputs from many institutions. Now, we're going to invite you to analyze a series of booklets that we've developed, because really, these have made a difference. They're a hard work. They've been created due to hard work and research. So lastly, before I continue with a presentation of each case, next slide, please. 
I want to tell you that the presentation is divided into phases in sub-regions in which our members of the CIS or this conference are organized. We have the Andes region with the Andean region cases, Colombia and Peru, Central America, with Costa Rica and El Salvador, the South Cone, with Argentina and Brazil. Those are the cases in the booklets, the documents from Brazil are pending publication, then North America and North Caribbean Anglo, Trinidad, Tobacco, Belize, amongst others. We're about to publish that other booklet, Mexico, Caribbean, and what's Latin here is going to be published as well. For the first region, I'll have the participation of one of our counterparts, which is called, whose name is Noe, our panel member. I'll introduce him to all the members of the region now, so it's going to be, it's time economics. Noe Rizzo is a researcher at DEPI. He is an investigator at CIS at this conference, a professor in healthcare epidemiology from the healthcare system, amongst other agencies. He's an administrator of the hospital network in University Cuauhtémoc. He received his accreditation in epidemics management from Hop John Hopkins University, Bloomberg Public Health University. He also achieved his degree from Copenhagen, Denmark, in the essentials of cardiometabolic public health CMD management course and he has an expertise when designing models and institutional programs or interfaces for healthcare segments. He's a professor conference man at an international scale. He's been invited by the International Health Organization in Geneva in Switzerland. He's worked with the Pan American Health Agencies, developed projects with the ministries of health in Bolivia, Chile, and Costa Rica. He's also worked in the public administration field in different positions in the government uh, field and specifically in health. Noe will speak about the Colombian booklet. Then he's going to, we're going to have the participation of Carlos Contreras, who's also a researcher in this conference. Carlos Contreras is actor, he's an actuary from the science the uh, department of UNAM. He has a master's in management and social security program management in Alcala University in Spain, a professor in uh, corporate finances, stock exchange in Anahuac South. He has uh, more than 19 years of experience as a professor. He has developed many generations in UNAM, the National Benemeritus University in, um, in many fields, Colombia, the Central University of Venezuela, in the IOT or um, ILO, LIO. He has worked in social security with different institutions in this country and at a global scale. He's worked with management, risk management administrator, Ido Pril from Dominican Republic. He's worked with a social security institute in Paraguay and in Foreign Affairs Ministry in Mexico, just to mention a few. He's also an author and published different journals, books, and booklets. Carlos uh, will be talking about the Equator case, that booklet, and he, we're going to have the participation of Ms. Veronica Samudio, who's also a researcher at CIS. He has a degree in economics through the Nayarit University. He's a professor in regional development from the collegiate body or institution at the, the north border in the collegiate body in Mexico. He's in charge of leading a project about how to manage risks in the Inter-American Conference on Social Security. Samudio is an expert in risk management and risk uh, mitigation emphasizing in the American region. He's also managed natural resources, especially water. She has worked in national forums, symposiums, uh, in which they've discussed risk management, disaster management. She's a professor in the economics sector of WAM University. He has also been a professor and give training in management of assets. He's been uh, in a, as a consulting agent for social security entities for to regulate uh, and be transparent in hydro projects, water projects in the Latin American context. Thank you so much, Ms. Amudio, and thank you to all our panel members for being part of this. Noe? Thank you so much. Welcome. Thank you for being present during the presentation of our booklet series. Once again, as my colleague just mentioned, Ingrid uh, just mentioned what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to share the outputs, the main results of that booklet that, due to the response. It's, we analyzed the response of the government of Colombia to understand and mitigate the impact of COVID-19. So in general, uh, the, the government had two responses or actions, an incremental, a yearly incremental to total budget to provide the right services in the healthcare field, they increased 2.6% of budget. The second response, and to satisfy the healthcare needs of their people, they created the mitigation fund for emergencies, the FOME. 
it's an acronym, and this uh, trust could budget the services and attentions required by the citizenship. Now, those who suffered the disease or suffered COVID now, and the consequences amidst the economic recession there, which is a strong point now, the response money-wise in uh, when uh, unemployment happened, you know, in different situations took place. I mean, there, we created programs and initiatives to support the workers at home and the de those who depend on them. We cr there was a creation of programs giving economic response or budget or support for those who suffered COVID. Now, we cre they created a program that had a social impact. It did penetrate all the stratigraphy in thousands of con in households. The program is called uh, Bogota Solidaria. There was a loss of a subsidy in uh, the pension schemes or funds there. People who lost their jobs could, pro could use uh, in that program a pension. So they created a program called Our Youth in Action or Jóvenes in Acción. It's for different groups. There were there, This group was constituted by kids that are 18 or older. We had another program that's called Familias in Acción that supplied services to 2.6 million households. In this program, we wanted to guarantee income to those households. It was audited or it was reviewed. With It was object of a cabinet study. We supported households or they supported the the homes that that needed that. In this country, they created another program that was called Ingreso Solidario or Solidarity due to that income. I mean, the Colombian government had a program to award to each household a speck of mo a bit of money. At least three million households received this service or this benefit there. Now, uh, when we speak about medical services, as in any other country in the world, there was a, a change. I mean, they retrofitted the hospital network. They had to improve the network in the emergency units at the, house, at the hospitals. And they had to create a restructure for the healthcare services that were offered because the patients were suffering COVID, major grievance, they required hospitalization, so that's why they did that. They could to, could be taken care of at home. We had to work at hospitals and understand the capacity or the beds that they had, and also the lodging or hotels were used. You know, by the government of Colombia, they established centers to provide the right attention to their population in places or venues that weren't hospitals. They they used hotels or other venues to provide attention. There were uh, like also services offered to people that were still receiving services at home. We're talking about kids under five or elders that are 65 and over. People who are pregnant receive certain services or that had some health condition that could make them vulnerable. So, Suffering COVID uh, amidst those conditions that the population had could worsen the the outputs, but the response of the Colombian government was the exemption of tax. It was weighed off, and there were some benefits or economic benefits offered to the population, and there were exemptions of tax collection, as I've said, and there were some tax exemptions, that some taxes that weren't covered or collected when somebody bought medications. I mean, there were certain actions by the Colombian government. There was a deferment in installments or payments due to the sewage systems or use of all the network. They, they were, there was a 36 month subsidy for those who asked for it without uh, having subjects be sanctioned or penalized because of the lack of payment. There were no like, uh, there was stratigraphy in the population, and they were classified as one, two, and three. And the taxes weren't collected in, the, in those types of subjects in our population because amidst the pandemic, they weren't enabled to contribute or to pay the taxes because they didn't have a fixed income as they used to have before the pandemic. So there was a tax wave off. Those were some of the main actions or responses implemented or exercised by the Colombian government, as I've said. And as it's been mentioned by our colleague or moderator, Ingrid, you can broaden the the understanding of the detail in the booklet, as I've said, it's published 
It's uploaded in our website in the interface. You can find it in the specific site to see the series of booklets that's, as I've said, is embedded now in the interface or site of the Inter-American Conference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. As you've commented, we've been working on reviewing the Equatorian case. In this review, in first instance, I'd like to thank all the government officials, the Equatorian Institute on Social Security. Thank you for reading the booklet. Thank you for giving us your outputs, your feedback, your suggestions to improve that booklet. In the Equatorian booklet, as in many other countries in our region, the Equatorian case, I mean, leads us to focus on medical attention on services, which is usually dedicated to curing an ill something and condition not in weird in the healthcare area, sometimes do not prevent. So many countries amidst the pandemic had to change, restructure hospitals so they could give more beds in the hospital networks that they had. Originally, in this country, they had 27 hospitals of public and private nature that were destined to provide the right services amidst the pandemic or the crisis. The pandemic spread. We had to change the structure of our hospitals, as Mr. Noé mentioned, as Dr. Noé mentioned. In the equator, multiply that times eight. We had to multiply the institutes that were used to provide services amidst the pandemic. There were some infrastructures, facilities created in parking lots and other types of venues or infrastructures that had to be adapted to give the service. In the equator, they have the national police forces. The institution, the police forces, gave support to healthcare institutions, networks of hospitals. They had to transport the patients to medical centers. The police forces reacted timely to also gather the bodies of people that unfortunately had died in their households. They went to, to properly treat the bodies of the deceased following the medical protocols. It was very important for us to analyze technology amidst the pandemic in the equator. The use of technology in the equator enabled us to develop an app for mobile phones. In the slide, that app was developed. It has clear objectives, which are four. Assess the symptoms related to COVID, to reference the people to a healthcare center. How? Through the creation of appointments with a physician in the interface there. I mean, to avoid having bottlenecks in the hospital networks. There are cases in which the symptomatology of the patients weren't as severe. We could offer remote uh, appointments with a physician there or, or appointments, but we had to discuss the use of the vaccines. The vaccines were also part of the application that was developed. People could also create or a record of their appointment in the app developed. It's very, I must point out that in the Equatorian context, in their case, they have specific, specific regimes or schemes for people that are self-employed, people that don't have an employer, an entity that kept their activities or job going, providing a salary. There are a lot of professionals whose activities were halted. They, they didn't have an income, so there are some payments deferred in long term, or the contributions were deferred when they had to pay uh, a fee to the to the social security entity in Ecuador. They were the payments were deferred, but the institute has its mandate. This happened amidst the pandemic in the equator. Uh, they uh, had a budget allocation to some people. It was feasible with this um, money. They could also allocated to households to be used wisely amidst the contingency. Those are some of the findings of the booklets. So you can go through your, your review. You can analyze the Equatorian case in the site of this Inter-American Conference. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to tell you that in the case of Peru, 
The most important points that were reinforced in this emergency for COVID-19 were specifically in two areas, health, how can we widen health coverage of the people that were affected by this pandemic, and also the topic of income protection. In this sense, also, I want to tell you that in Social Security, under um, this light, we continue with a very important role in widening the coverage for, or for people that were uh, that had already an insurance, precisely in health questions, but people that were not covered, and this widening of the infrastructure was given through the widening of an important percentage of beds of intensive care units. The I see you. This unit has been responsible, at least during the first year of pandemic, of the widening of 38.3% of these beds of intensive care at a national level. And at the same time, 23 centers of attention and temporary isolation for the cases of detected that couldn't be attended or taken care of from their homes. And likewise, the strategy to widen this coverage, this alliances, the private sector of health, has participated directly, um, allowing that the people insured or not could decide what health institution to take care of, including these institutions, these private institutions. With respect to the investment, 20.8% uh, of the year 2020 that was destined to the infrastructure and uh, protection care equipment to cover these new needs for the widening of the coverage in medical attendance, medical care. Also, to tell you that one of the health areas that were open, like very important or emergent, were precisely the attention of mental health. We think that pandemic has made clear that this area of attention is one of the priority areas. And in the case of Peru, we implemented a network, which was Network Amachai, which is addressed to adults that were having a difficult situation of movement that required a specific attention. And this network was possible. Uh, through the telephone that was taken care of in people that were trained in the incomes of one also to tell you that it's in the social protection and the area that was used as a strategic area was the one of the payments and also facilitating the payments at home and the extraordinary retributions that are equivalent to minimum vital remunerations. And at the same time, they also allowed the extraordinary um, people that in completion with this training of the incomes, they had a strategy of money transfers addressed to people that were poor or not poor, and people that had surpassed the line of poverty through the bonuses of the Ministry of Social Development. And also, these amounts of the transferences were over the line of monetary poverty that is approximately $106 American dollars. Also, to tell you that one of the population groups that was considered that was found in the situation of vulnerability and also required and special attention was the pe were the people in the period of lactation and they facilitated to perform their work remotely. 
And finally, also to tell you that in the case of Peru, we detected a very interesting practice through the compensation for a service time, this GS, that it's um, or is associated precisely for unemployment, that in this situation of pandemic, it was possible to implement precisely because there was before. So it was a support undoubtedly for the companies that required to make temporarily certain adjustments in their staff without affecting the rights of this um, people, the working people of service time. These are the most important points that we have to take care of today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now we will present the documents of Costa Rica and El Salvador that correspond to Region 2 in Central America. Costa Rica is in charge of NOE, to whom I already introduced. In the case of El Salvador, will be presented by our colleague Lourdes Jimenez Brito, who is a researcher of the seas, a politologist in public administration and in constitutional right, candidate to political science of seas in Mexico, and a specialist in policies of care with perspective of gender by the Latin American Council of Social Sciences. She is a specialist of seas in topics of maternity, care and social security from a gender focus, and she has given services of consultancy in topics of gender and equity, and she has written the book uh, that conceptualizes maternity as a social risk. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Well, in this case, as Ingrid mentioned, I'm going to talk about the main in the topic of social security to take care of the needs of the problems generated by pandemic 2019. In 0.5 percentage point in the GDP for the attention particularly of the problems that COVID was generating and the population that was taken care of for the health services in this country. In medical care in the problems that had the government of Costa Rica was the problem of COVID that to give information to the population. In different countries, reviewing the manuals was possible. There was an infodemic that accompanied that accompanied the deceased people that collected information everywhere. They did not where they did not know where to address themselves in order to look for services or their families derived from the implementation of certain programs and certain actions. And also they habilitated a phone line in order to grant medical counseling um, to the people that required it through remotely that would talk with professionals with a greater security. We also performed the strengthening of the hospital network. There were a widening of colleagues and they issued by decree the possibility of analyzing the intensive care units of the private sector among the main increase that the people from Costa Rica had to do. They were done in San Jose, where the greater uh, population of the country is gathered. They increased Hospital Calderon, also Hospital Mexico and San Juan de Dios, trying to reach and mainly to have enough access. And let's remember that in the first year, we didn't have the possibility of being vaccinated. So then the acute process of COVID was more lethal than the one that we are experiencing today. According to the unemployment for the 
workers uh, independent or with the reduced working journey. We had to protect this. And they offered uh, the government of Costa Rica in order to take care of the basic needs of the people. They uh, deposited a quantity linked to the minimum wage that they had in Costa Rica. At the same time, they also offered 50,000, which was destined for the people that had lost their employment. And through this mechanism, they could adopt new practices in order to use the information technology and communications in order to develop themselves in another environment. And that was not in person to learn to know how to use the camera and the platforms that we have and to be able to perform some activities as community management, among others. And um, according to the facilities, we increase the elderly insurance and the debt insurance. The family benefits that they granted were food at home in order to give um, food to people that were lactating or pregnant or with small children. Another measure was the um, payment of quotas for mortgages and the suspension of the judicial collection in delay of less than 90 days. And uh, they wanted to know, and with respect to the psicoteca, they also reviewed the implementation of telework with, by decree, and they did the suspension by the working journey, looking to improve the commingling inside the homes. And one of the main objectives that they had was to favor mental health in every aspect that we have encompassed. Mental health has always been side by side, these kind of programs that they have implemented or policies that go along with the governments, in this case, the government of Costa Rica. I invite you again to verify this booklet that is published in our web page. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you so much for the opportunity. For those of us that work with implementation, our dream is that the representatives of Social Security may hear us, may read what we wrote, and may have access to what we consider could be useful for their daily work of Social Security of their respective countries, the members of these conferences. I am going to tell you very briefly what happened in Salvador, what was the response of the government of Salvador uh, with respect to Social Security, and this was written by my colleague Frida Romero Suarez in collaboration with the conference. In the case of El Salvador, we're going to have a very early declaration of the emergency national state in public and the system of uh, security of Salvador covers at least six of these benefits that we consider from the beginning in the case of this country. And we have six benefits where they had a response of the government in the first place. In the topic of reallocation or allocation of initial budget, we're going to see an important allocation two different questions of fund of emergency, recovery, economic problems, and um, we have to highlight that these titles of public debt in the public attendance, uh, we will see this area of health and even the construction of a new hospital in El Salvador and the habilitation of the spaces that we saw in the region of the international centers of conventions that became the spaces of attention for COVID patients exclusively. We must highlight that in the case of the monetary benefits by disease, 
and it was considered as temporary for common disease and the private companies should guarantee and the workers and they created a uh, for life care in the first line of attention for COVID-19 in the case of death we're going to see that this is a very in this country and mainly I'm going to tell you that in Argentina the same thing happened a monthly part for the working people that for COVID in $300 monthly with 1.5 million homes. We have to highlight also, next one please, that we have a sanitary emergency program where we had a distribution of food packages and all that was the security forces in El Salvador with an important scope of 10 million uh, packages given in the pandemic, mainly in the more strict quarantine. These measures were also seen complemented by the control and financial of maximum operations of the measures of protecting the income of homes. As our colleagues were saying, the payments of public services, uh, taxes, ISR, and also the measures to mitigate the lack of payments in credits just to complete this study, this is a brief summary, but the profiles of countries that we have prepared, we also have included pre-pandemic as a way in every country of the different parts of social security, a comparison, and also some conclusions with respect to the impacts that these measures had. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Noe and Lourdes, for this presentation. The cases of Argentina and Brazil that correspond to the corner south. And in the case of Argentina will be presented by our colleague Lourdes, who I already introduced. And in the case of Brazil, it will be presented by my colleague Soledad Buendia, who is a researcher. Definitely, she is a politologist, Equatorian. In the gender and human rights, she is a professor uh, in topics of governance and public policies with the focus of gender. She performs as a research in the seas in Mexico City. As a researcher, she has developed the topic of sexual politic uh, violence. She has published We Are Women, Politic Violence, and Gender. She has received international acknowledgments. Her recent research is uh, educational education with the focus on gender. Thank you so much, and go ahead. Well, then again, just to tell you a little bit, the study that we did about Argentina, and here we also have the review on the part of the officials of the Social Security and Argentina. In the case of this country, we will see measures that will be in the social security contributive and non contributive and the creation of new transferences. We will see a strong program of strengthening of attention which are linked which are elderly and um, in order to have this economic part and formal work. In the framework of medical attendance, we saw an expansion of uh, health services. And the first thing that we did was to increase the sanitary emergency, which is a figure that we use in these countries. And uh, what it allowed is to have some administrative processes in the quality of emergency of the situation for pandemic, resources acquisition, and so forth. A budget increased to the Ministry of Health and the different hospital networks, the construction of module hospitals, and a percentage that was destined for the scientific and technological ones. And remember, that Noe was talking about the research in order to find vaccines in the region. 
With respect to the survival and the creation of racism, I was telling you that in El Salvador, we also had lifetime benefit for COVID-19. And in this case, there was some temporary conditions. And we thought that the 30th of September <coughs> of 2020, as a consequence of having suffered COVID-19. Next one, please. So basing ourselves on the transfer of measures and the income, we created and implemented the family emergency income, which is a monetary uh, benefit to compensate the decrease of this, which is socioeconomic. And they paid, they paid uh, three editions of the EFA and for the quantity of persons that they covered in the transference of um, direct part history of that country and of Argentina and the point of seat of the economy. And um, In the formal work, they create the programs of emergency assistance of production oriented to employers, independent workers that did not achieve to enter the IFE, and it included payment of the wages and the reduction of 95% of the payment of the employer's contributions for Argentina. So formal and the ones that did mainly was to grant credit to rate zero through a credit card. These measures were completed by others. For example, the development of costs in basic services that they couldn't pay as uh, water, light, internet, and also the suspension of some parts in the policies of maximum prices in trade, the companies buy moratories of impositive payments. In very brief summary, these were the main measures of the Argentinian government in topics of social security. I'll pass the floor to my colleague Soledad. Thank you. Thank you so much, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, worked in Brazil in the institutions, especially the team of Dr. Rogero Magamine. I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing it correctly, doctor. It's fundamental for this research work that we present today and that we hope that we allow that the decision makers for the region that are participating of this space will know the good practices in the different countries to highlight that the protection system, social protection system of Brazil was one of the main uh, tools in order to mitigate the impact of pandemic uh, for employment, incomes, and the application of protection measures to the health in every population. There were highlighted in a summarized way and with respect to these policies to increase the ability of the access to medical care and rehab. Obviously, we have to highlight here that we included the hospital conversion with its plans of national contingency, the campaigns of formation, and a system of fast tests in order to detect the disease. And we had the quantity of medical equipment, and we increased technology and mobile applications in order to give response to that population. We performed medical consultations in different topics, including the topic of mental health, and we implemented the medications at home. So this was an adequate response that allowed that the population could have taken care of. 
we had immunization plan in order to reach the total coverage at the end of 2021 in the whole population in Brazil. This was done through the uh, BAHO and the COVAC, the bilateral agreements and the technology transference with the regional administration with respect to the monetary renderings by the seas, we established transferences by the people that were sick by COVID-19 with the health and the possibility of increasing the benefits for the seas and continuous benefits for this and the payments of the yearly allocation and the bonus. With respect to the benefits for elderly, there were several policies, but one to highlight the demand of the yearly presentation of the beneficiaries for the attention of protection and the increase to elderly people that protected this vulnerable uh, population and avoided these uh, bottlenecks, and also for the salary of the people that were retired and the National Institution of Social Security. We have to highlight the measures of protection with maternity and also for the protection of pregnant women, women, teenagers that were uh, pregnant and measures of the income. We want to highlight the protection of employment that was implemented through the program of employment and that they increase the total way, this increase of unemployment that established the benefit that was paid uh, with agreements in the working people and the program of monetary transference and help of emergency for families of vulnerability and other workers, informal workers of low resources that were obviously exposed during the crisis of pandemic. To this, we also add the distribution of food, school, in order to take care of the most vulnerable population of sanitary crisis, and the distribution of basic baskets in order to take care of high-risk population. And uh, this was in the topic of emergency that impacted in a positive way the protection of the population in Brazil. This is but a small summary of those measures implemented so we invite you to analyze and see the booklet that we will publish in our page and uh, this organization of the systems and approaches. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so very much. And now we'll have the presentation of North America and the Caribbean. This is in charge of our colleague Krishna, who will present the case of Belize, and Miguel, who will present the case of Canada and Trinidad and Tobago, which will be in charge of Krishna. Krishna Pushkatla is a researcher, and he is a professor in population studies. He is a researcher in topics with respect to demography, public policies about aging, and systems of information in Americas. He is a specialist in research with qualitative and quantitative methods applied to statistics, and he has performed as a researcher and coordinator of projects in different public statistics and in topics with occupational health, education, public security, government, and data. So Miguel Angel Ramirez, the head of the project division here in Adefi, is the bachelor for the Autonomous University in Xochimilco and the master in political science and by the National University of Mexico. He is head of the projects of the CIS, where he also performed as public policies in projects and research. He has been a consultant in research about social policy for the Council of Evaluation of this Mexico City. He has publishings of social security and social policies in Mexico and Latin America. He also has experience as a consultant in electoral topics and public opinion. Please go ahead. Thank you, Ingrid. Well, I'm going to continue talking about the case of the IFE. This document of research was leadered and made 
by our colleague Ana Kiple, and also uh, they provided us with certain data. The Institute of Social Security of Belize, and we could specify four great categories of analysis that allow us to put this presentation of medical attention and um, elderly and other measures destined to the protection of incomes for some priority groups. So then I'll start by talking about medical care. In other systems of Social Security, we had a reconfiguration in order to take care of the patients, the people of COVID-19, and this was littered by the Ministry of Health. And before I forget, even if there are the nine branches of Social Security in Belize, uh, the head of Social Security, the Ministry of Health, and medical health and finances suffered a collaboration in order to face pandemic. So then, with respect to these employments and the seas, the regulation and benefits of the Social Security Board had certain modifications in order to allow the people that were unemployed, that they were insured, in the meeting of Social Security to allow them to have an income and support during three months. So this was in the contributive environment. In the non contribute we elaborated a program of unemployment, a program of emergency, in order to give a minimum income to the people that worked and that lost their work due to pandemic. So we'll continue talking about our seniors, our elders. The, the Social Security Board anticipated a pension payment for our seniors, for those elders and the benefits of retirement and disability survivors and for those who are deceased, you know, uh, it was formal. For for us to protect the other group of the population, we had other measures in place. Some were new, there were some, some extensions of time there. We focused on groups that are priority. We had the transference cash uh, transference program amidst COVID-19. That cash transference program, uh, well, enabled us to award 75 US dollars monthly. We paid that amount during six months to households. These households were constituted by specific members, like elders, senior, like our seniors, people with different capacities, abilities, children, and women. In the other program, in the goods program, what we pretend to achieve there we wanted to give the seniors who live in marginalization or poverty or in this household where there's kids, mothers. Well, in this program, we broadened the scope to include other beneficiaries. We had also grocery programs or that were sent to specific beneficiaries or the, like the basic uh, commodities or goods were reserved to be sent to the beneficiaries and uh, some some benefits weren't exercised because of the quarantine. I mean, there's other findings in the booklet, in the instrument. You can see it's been uploaded in our website. Thank you so much. Thank you, I hope you're all having a great afternoon. Let's change a bit the dynamism of today's sequence um, of presentations. I'd like to quote Nicolas Machiavello at The Prince, and I quote him like this, I judge that it's probably certain that we are left to 
head or to be in the government. Machiavello spoke about fortune and compared it to a violent river that can destroy everything on its path, but he also said that that's not gonna stop us from taking preventive measures to create or build dams to avoid that destruction caused by the river. Social security systems are precisely that. They're the dams that prevent or try to avoid the loss of life amidst contingencies. The Canadian booklet amidst the COVID-19 pandemic, I mean, Canada had its response with dams and the right infrastructure when the emergency just started. That's how I would say summarize the pandemic in this case by pointing out number one, they d created their plans two decades before to stop the spread of infectious respiratory disease, flexibilization, flexibility and criteria of monetary strategies and the creation of new benefits. I will expose briefly each element in that case. The sanitary, the response of this economy was based on plans designed since two, 2004 to avoid the spread of respiratory disease because in Canada in 2002 they had the SARS spread and that emergency led or triggered the government's actions to at a federal level to draft programs in the territory and provinces. One. Uh, uh, of the plans as Canadian influenza plan for to be prepared, its preparedness plan. The Canadian response wasn't constrained to those programs that were previously drafted. They drafted new strategies amidst the situation. They had a province territorial plan to mitigate with a strategy the spread of COVID-19. And they adapted, the plan adapted to the needs that that economy was facing with its authorities. There was a clear response in the, due to the health crisis, the federal government included different supports to the provinces in their territory. They supplied economic benefits and other assets or goods and continued monitoring the spread of the pandemic. You have a list of benefits, an extraordinary payment free of tax for those people in their communities that could be benefited by the old age security program. It's a pension scheme for the elders. They also modified some criteria or items uh, like there are specific wait times to have access to workers' benefits. There were uh, also certificates like doctor certificates, credits, specific insured hours of labor for those that do, that didn't have specific benefits in the minimum work days. I mean, some didn't have access to uh, uh, unemployment benefits and others, but they had to go through a cumbersome effort to create the rep benefits for their citizenship. When the emergency started, the federal government in Canada, they had the emergency response benefit program that was active in March 2020. And that program enabled people to receive a budget because they were unemployed, because they couldn't work, because they were confined in quarantine, or because they were suffering COVID-19. Uh, some people received that economic benefit because they were taking care of, of others. They were caregivers. So uh, this program was active for months and they paid this benefit to more than 8.9 million people. They created a way with a strategy to protect the income and enable economic recovery. They had the Canada Recovery Benefit Program for those who were unemployed. They had the Canada Recovery Sickness Benefits because they were sick amidst the COVID. They were confined, isolated, or they had a medical condition that made them vulnerable amidst the situation. They also had the Canada Recovery Caregiving Benefit for those that couldn't work because they were taking care of others, minors or other people that needed extra care. These programs were highly effective according to official numbers. They reduced the number of people that lived in a low income home for example, in January 2020, 23.4% of the population in Canada lived in this housing developments with low income before the pandemic. Now, in April, when the pandemic was full set, I mean, the benefits uh, had a 7.7 percentage. That was the benefit, 77 and they reached the 7.8%. With that economic benefit, they cut down or had a decline in the quantification of population that lived in this 
low marginalized household developments or that worked or was in effect during the first year of the pandemic. They used or over 116 million U Canada dollars. The, the federal government had its strategy and transferred income to the households or summarizing the Canadian strategy avoided destruction. They created their dams and prevention before the pandemic had started. Thank you very much. That's all I have to say for now. Thank you so much. So let's continue with the region for North Caribbean Anglo region. We also analyzed and researched what happened in Trinidad and Tobago. In this research, this research, I mean, we were very active. The ministries of social development in Trinidad and Tobago was very active in the Department of Family Services. They supported us when creating this booklet. They supported us with their interviews. We had the securities board working with us in Tobago, analyzing what we researched, our investigation. Trinidad and Tobago coordinated its efforts with different agencies, institutions, just like Belize did. They drafted different measures for the protection of income and what was happening in the medical field. There are very interesting measures that I'm going to submit now to you first. Regarding the medical attention or in that field, like in other cases, this economy built infrastructure, hospital infrastructure for primary, secondary, third care services. They had to buy, uh, well, different, um, well, tools, equipped the units, they hired beds, they got uh, oxygenation devices, they hired other human resources and material resources amidst 2019 too. All of these actions were like the common denominator in different social security systems. Besides this, the Ministry of Health implemented a strategic campaign to publish or communicate objective information due to COVID. They communicated what was happening to the communities, to the population, which it was crucial because there was a lot of information, fake news, a lot of information that was being spread amongst the citizenship as well. but. That's what happened on one side, but in the segment of medical services, the Ministry of Social Development and Family Services drafted a couple of instruments with the measures. One that's important, they had a call center service to have a general appointments amidst the pandemic, psychological support and consultation uh, was also provided with those hotlines. They also worked with with their citizenship, those who had suffered violence or domestic violence or any type of abuse amidst COVID, they had like a measure in place that was called stay at home in Trinidad and Tobago. So, so we continue now today. There's another block of measures that were created and destined to protect the people's income, measures that were Mm, transferences. There was some budget subsidy, or they were some. They credited some. They used uh, a fund of 225 dollars, U.S. dollars, and allocated that to specific families in case they lost their income or they were unemployed uh, in the families. You know, so they also developed a, an assistance program. They had a clear objective, and with a program, they wanted to provide 375 U.S. dollars during a three, a quarter, a three-month term. So, this was allocated to households that were constituted by different members of the family. There were people at household homes that simply lost their job; they were unemployed, so they had that cut. There were some aids and programs. Some are, here I have a set of examples. We have the school programs, food coupons for our kids and at a local scale. The government 
also allocated specific budget uh, and religious institutions also participated to aid people in vulnerable conditions. Another program was the subsidy of the public assistance program. In this program, they gave uh, more support. Uh, they benefited with salary or with income a specific subject who were in poor health conditions. They allocated that money to people who were who became orphans amidst the pandemic. They gave that for a three-month term. They supported temporarily oh, with income. They supported the elders, seniors. They supported others who were disabled. Uh, there were some other pendings, and they were still waiting to review what they had to do at the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health had to define who was going to be benefited. On other measures that were led by the Ministry of Health in this country were, first, they created or built a center for the homeless they, to, to provide that coverage to over 60 people. There was another action that was crucial Amidst the pandemic, what happened is they created the National People's Registry, People's Registry, but people who are in conditions of vulnerability. There's a roster in a database. They compile, process data in that uh, unit. They quantify the people that live in those conditions. They have access or the government has access to them. They can provide benefits with social programs. Thank you so much. Thanks. As a conclusion or to wrap up today's presentations, we're going to focus on the last region, which is Mexico and Latin Caribbean. In the fifth booklet, we have uh, the information of Mexico with Carlos Contreras and from Dominican Republic. We're going to listen to Mr. Noé Rizzo. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. When we write or draft something about our countries, we'd like to have the best data as reference, but amidst a crisis that had no president, the response was not probably the best in comparison to other responses. So I mean, when compared to other responses of different countries, this country was didn't just sit down and cross its arms. I want to first of all thank all the institutions that were part of the creation of this instrument or booklet. In this case, I thank the Pan American Office for Health in the Mexican unit or Department, the Ministry of Health. I'd like to thank the National Healthcare Center of Preventive Programs and Disease Control. From the center, we drafted the vaccination policies. What's happened in our country? The highlights are that 449 venues had to be modified. You know, we had them. The infrastructure was there before the pandemic. It was a nationwide effort. We had to change that, those centers to give the services to those people that were symptomatic or asymptomatic. Now, what was very important in all our nation, I'm sure that you've heard about this, there were specific releases or announcements that crossed borders. For example, the the race, uh, the race venue called Autodromo Hernández Hermano Rodríguez, those uh, centers or sports centers were modified to provide service to those who were suffering COVID. That infrastructure was up and running till 2021, but that racetrack was like modified, but the challenges were many. We had the Formula One Grand Prix prize race going on. It was suspended so we could provide the services in this racetrack amidst COVID-19. There were other infrastructures that were modified at the Expo Center called City Banamex Center. You can visit the facilities, you can visit, and thanks to National Autonomous University, we were capable of installing there a set of beds 
cubicles, areas to provide service and attention to those uh, in our population that weren't in terrible conditions. There is another case in the state entity called Guadalajara, and this other entity, the university and the university's hospital was adapted to receive more patients. Without doubt, these were one of the measures that are relevant. In record time, we had over 450 uh, infrastructures that had to be modified to, to achieve with capacity and meet the needs of this pandemic. We had a deficit in human resources. I mean, the first responders, I mean, they were there. We had a deficit, a lot in the medical staff, nurses, management, administrators in the healthcare system were had to stop working. Some people had to stop working because of their comorbidities. I mean, we had to hire healthcare professionals, people in the healthcare field, and we hired or called in other people from other economies. Cuban doctors came to Mexico to provide their knowledge and services from abroad amidst the emergency during the second wave of uh, the spread in Mexico City. Mexico City, you can see its dimensions. The city was highly affected. There are people in different state entities of this republic that willfully traveled to Mexico City in an operation that was called Operación Chapultepec that was led by the Mexican Social Security Institute to try to stop the spread, and it was a lethal spread. It happened during the months of January and February of 2021. The rest of the measures and actions in place, it, what was executed, it was simply the process of adaptation of the existing hospital network. For example, there was we had the operation of daycare systems, of the daycare units for working moms. Working moms that were providing a service in essential tasks, that they couldn't just stay at home. I mean, so the daycare system and the daycare network had to operate with specific restrictions to support all these working moms or parents that were there as first responders amidst the the, the pandemic. There were other programs to to satisfy the needs of our elders. There's a universal pension for the well-being of our elders or our seniors. That program enabled the government to provide installments for those who are in their 65 and 70, 78 years of age, and they received some money, some budget, indirectly, but directly from government. Every two months through the program, government the government deposits or debits and credits an account. In, and during the month of May, the government asks the population to continue social distancing and execute the measures in place and continue confinement. So the payment of this program was done in advance so the people who are seniors didn't have the need to leave their households. There was some benefit program due to unemployment. But in this country, we don't have the benefits of unemployment due to, to this. So in Mexico, uh, in the Mexico City, we have a population density that's top. We have unemployment safety or uh, securities there for the unemployed. And amidst the pandemic, the program that supported the unemployed uh, was, I mean, had an extension of six months. Those who lost their job due to the pandemic had the chance to receive that economic benefit. On the other hand, there was unemployment aid programs, and it's part of the General Health Act, that law. There's people that have their savings account for retirement, and those people under specific conditions can use the partial funds that they've accrued for their retirement. That program was very agile. It's, those, that program was used by the population due to their laws of uh, employment. And, and we think about what happened with the healthcare services. Uh, Mexico color coded uh, with indicators what was happening here. Mexico color coded the reports for the population. They codified the communication, as you know. Nowadays, we're all doing better in, in our economics. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, Dr. Noé, the, the word is yours, sir. Thank you, Carlos, very much. So we're going to now review. We're going to study what we generated in the cabinet's report. 
in Dominican Republic. In that booklet, I want to mention that Donatio Martinez participated for, to create that, bo uh, that booklet, and Ms. Mariela Sanchez-Belmont was also part of the development of this booklet series. Part of the main activities that the government of Dominican Republic had was the government increased the budget they allocated for health. They allocated more budget for health in 2019-2020. The, the incremental percentage is 14. The medical units received budget, a programmed scheduled budget to satisfy the medical services, a, a high percentage of the total budget. They signed many, many agreements with public and private uh, healthcare institutions whether they're private or public, they signed it off. So these institutions provided the services to the population. They also drafted a protocol to diagnose and treat COVID-19. In that instrument, that, pro that medical protocol, they documented and gave a critical route and critical instructions for healthcare professionals or first responders who are part of the healthcare system so they could redirect according to the instrument what they, they needed to execute if measures made it possible. They needed to recover our people's health because they were suffering. I mean, the, their patients were suffering COVID. We also have a medical attention trust fund there, you know, that's there uh, as budget, budget that that's in the hands of the state. With it, they finance tests, the test, COVID test, being admitted to the hospital and discharged from the hospital. There were some monetary programs they reimbursed the payment of medications that some populations, ha the population had bought. There was a broadening of the coverage of lab tests for COVID-19 for those who are members of the benefits or members are uh, affiliated or non-affiliated subjects that had access to social security or not. They broadened the scope of the program. In the sur survival benefits, th they also awarded a benefit systematically with a contribution scheme. The benefits of that fee that was paid, I mean, okay, those benefits, um, the benefits to those who survived uh, the passing of a loved one received the benefits at some point. There was a program called Program PATI, P-A-T-I. I think they had a very a great success with that program. And they have the solidarity program for the certain employees. They Some um, workers were benefited to face head on the situation and satisfy the needs that our population had in COVID-19 in Dominican Republic. The Dominican Republic was no exception. There was another program that was called Stay at Home, which was color coded as well. The government asked uh, the population to change their routines. They started uh, working from home. The population worked and telework remotely out of headquarters. They're, they also ordered another program that was called like the um, Solidarity Program. They modified the Superate Program and with it they allocated some credit lines or line of credit for those who received some benefits of Social Security through government. There were some uh, booklets that I presented to you today. I had the opportunity to participate with the superintendent's unit and labor risks unit. I worked with uh, our actuary, Leticia Martinez, and the economist, Karina Mena. I'd like to mention them and acknowledge their great effort, a lot of work there. Thank you, Leticia, for contributing to this um, booklet series. We invite you once again to analyze what's been uploaded in our website. It's user-friendly. You can download the booklets, as I've said, and that were generated by us at the panel, me and my peers. Uh, I The booklet that I I've just um, mentioned to you the Dominican Republic series, so thank you so much. Once again, I thank all our colleagues here. Thank you for, for sharing or submitting this booklet series with us today. Thank you for the presentation. I also like to especially thank uh, Vanessa Stoberlinovsky, Executive Director of our Research Projects at CIS. She coordinated and was there monitoring the creation or development of the booklets that constitute the series. She's here present with us. 
And uh, we're about to, we have two minutes left, so uh, just some um, briefing or we don't have time for a Q&A or question and answers here, but or else we'd be, have be lunchless. But I'll mention a few points that my colleagues have said. We've rescued and compiled the hard work of all of the economies involved in this booklet series. We analyze the responses here. There is a lot of effort. We have to modify the infrastructures and, uh, well, use the budget and operate it through transferences, right? So this analytical effort enables us to see what the different stakeholders have have to deal to deal with in the national healthcare systems and and there's that there's some some of our people in our population that simply could not go to like the hospital networks to get a service so the right is not yet universal for those who are subjects in our population whether they're regulated or unregulated there's different types of jobs there's people that are regulated or not that's there's immigrants that don't have access to a formal job but on the other hand we have to narrow the gaps that our populations have when they try to get services or social security benefits. You know, amidst the pandemic, we've said there's GI work, platform work, telework programs there. Something to be very mindful about is that you can find the exact numbers in the booklets. You have the exact number of doctors per capita, per numbers of population. I mean, I mean, there's so much hard data that we have in these booklets that we, we could not communicate to you today. You can query it in the interface we know that the apps played a crucial role. These applications that were developed amidst the pandemic were extremely important for appointments with your doctor remotely. These are actions and plays that were extremely relevant amidst the pandemic. We need to understand still that people have no access to internet yet, not all and they don't all have access to technologies. We have to analyze and study the importance of the monetary transferences and the impact that these had in short, mid, and long term. Lastly, I'd like to thank all the people, all the stakeholders that contributed and gave their time. There were interviews. We sat down, reviewed the instruments, and we drafted and developed the booklet series. They're all free for you to access. You can distribute to spread the word. Thank you so much. Now, in our today's program, we have lunch. We have a menu for that is a tribute to the Southern Cone in the subregion. We wait for you at the Palapa, at our treehouse.